Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. Oh gosh. Now, uh, for uh, all three of us were trial judges, so we knew that when the veneer was in front of us, if we said good morning and that was the response, the jury selection was going to be a little longer. So let's try the good morning. All right. Perfect. Outstanding. Uh, so uh, substituting into my left and to your right is the Honorable Noah Hood, who we are very grateful has joined us in this first case. Uh, that is on our docket today. Uh, after the first case is completed, we're going to take what we used to call in the Navy, the Marine Corps, a health and comfort break. And we'll go back. Uh, we will thank Judge Hood for joining us. And then when we come back out and reconstitute for the remainder of our cases today, we'll have Judge uh, Letica with us. So I wanted to thank Judge Hood uh, for stepping in. Um, you, when when uh, we need a different judge, when our court needs a different judge, they're usually courteous and well, not our staff is always courteous, but you, you can say no. And he did not say no. So he's, uh, we appreciate it. No, I realize you. you can say no. no. <laughs> uh oh, the cat's out of the bag. I, I heard, I've heard you could say no, but at any rate. Uh, okay. So my name is uh, James Redford. I have the privilege of serving with Judges Hood and Judge Cameron in the cases for today. Uh, it'll be Judge Ledica later. There are a couple of preliminary matters just to address. Um, one, uh, we've had the opportunity and we thank the lawyers for the briefs that you've submitted. Uh, we've reviewed them, uh, they're comprehensive. Uh, we also have the benefit, many of you, I see familiar faces, you understand we also have research reports and bench memorandums from our either in-chambers law clerks or one of the 50 other lawyers that work for the Michigan Court of Appeals so we are well-versed on the issues you are bringing before us. We thank you for that and for your advocacy to the extent that there are controlling cases and most of the issues uh, most of us have either recently read or are very familiar with. So the point of all that is not to dissuade you from uh, zealously advocating on behalf of your client because we look forward to that, but you don't need to start uh, in the beginning, the Lord created, you know, so just, you know, get to the salient points. That's the most efficient use of your time. Uh, some of the cases, the first one, uh, case number 14, for example, has multiple parties. It's 30 minutes on each side since we've consolidated. If you are unopposed for oral argument, you get 15 minutes. If there are minors uh, that are involved in the case, either as witnesses or as uh, potential complaining witnesses or victims, or if it's a termination parental rights case. And in almost all of our cases today, some, the, some minor is involved in that type of status in one of the cases. Do not use the child's full name, just use the initials if it's necessary to refer to the uh, child uh, by name or, or by designation specifically. Um, I think that's all I've got. I'm going to ask Judges Cameron and Judge Hood if I've missed anything, but I thank you all for being here and look forward to the cases. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Court calls the first matter on our docket today. It is matter of number 14. It involves five consolidated appeals. Uh, the parties on the plaintiff and appellant side are either David Busaka and or Lauren Sc Scipiani or both, and on the respondent, defendant appellee's side, on some of these, uh, it's Oakland County Under Sheriff McCabe or the Oakland County deputies, John Doe's, or uh, <clears throat> another individual from uh, Oakland County, Paul Walton. There are appeals and cross appeals. Uh, in this case, we've reviewed them. The case numbers are 360903, 364069, 365068, 365293, and 365944. Um, my suggestion is, and I know uh, plaintiff appellants are 
the appellees on the um, case evaluation, uh, not not case evaluation, sorry. I was reading your pleadings this morning and I have the case evaluation court rule in my mind on the offer of judgment sanctions. My suggestion is that you address that in your primary remarks and that uh, uh, Appelli, you will address both those issues. You're not going to get to stand up a second time. Okay. So you don't need to reserve anything. If you want to reserve, uh, just let me know how much time you want to reserve. I'll try to keep the clock running. Uh, it's, I seem to be able to manage it okay yesterday. We'll see what happens today. So any questions before we get started? All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Steve Hicks on behalf of uh, the plaintiffs. I'll just call them the plaintiffs since we're both appellants and pillars. Uh, David Basaka and Lauren Chapani. Uh, Brother Counsel and I actually talked yesterday about how to proceed with this argument, given that we have so many consolidated cases. And our thought, the first one on the docket is actually uh, an evidentiary issue that they raised where they are the appellant. Uh, I, I was going to rely oh, on there is that one effort. Yeah. yeah, I apologize. I'm just going to rely on my briefing on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to address that unless the court has has questions about that particular issue. Obviously, they, the summary disposition was granted, even though they did not get that statement uh, that the SOC had made. Uh, so I was I was hoping to cut right to the chase and go to the summary disposition rulings in this case. Uh, similarly, with regard to the offer of judgment sanctions issue, I, I don't really have uh, much to add there uh, either, unless the court has questions. Um, the cases are different, but that's noted in our brief. One went to case evaluation before the rule change, but that's really the only significance there. Um, so if I can, I'd like to go just right to the, the summary disposition uh, rulings, because that uh, obviously we're no place if we don't get there. And, 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 the, and the offer of judgment issue may, maybe goes away if we... Uh, uh, if we get, get a remand on it. So, so that's how I, I plan to proceed and, and brother counsel was uh, gracious enough to, to agree to that. So, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, with regard to the summary disposition ruling, I get just two, two statements up front, which I, I think are probably obvious to the court. Um, but this is of course their motion for summary disposition based on a governmental immunity defense. Uh, they bear the burden on that. Uh, they are the one that have to establish uh, the that uh, governmental immunity uh, is going to apply in this context. And on top of that, uh, it being a summary disposition motion under C7 and C10, um, the, the evidence does need to be viewed in the light most favorable uh, to, to my clients as the non-moving parties. Uh, I think that sometimes that gets lost in our briefing because there's a lot of context that needed to be shared with the court about this case. There's, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that, that went on. And, and all of those things I think are, are are germane in some way, um, but they, they unfortunately take away the focus from where I think the focus should be properly in this case, which is on the actions of, in particular, uh, under Sheriff McCabe uh, and Prosecutor Walton. So I, I just say that, say that up front. Uh, with regard to the, uh, we have two separate uh, tort cases, one out of Wayne County, one out of Oakland County. Um, <laughs> yes, did you want to reserve any? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'll go too far, but five, five minutes, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for reminding me. Yep. Um, yeah, we have the, we have the two cases, one, one coming out of Wayne County, one coming out of Oakland County, uh, the Wayne County filing, um, also involved the defamation claim, much like, uh, the one in Oakland County, but it's primarily a tortious interference claim, uh, as well as malicious prosecution and conspiracy claim. I will focus on the tortious interference aspect of that. Um, but again, if I can reiterate, the focus here needs to be on what McCabe uh, did in the in the Wayne County case and what McCabe and Walton in particular did when we talk about the Oakland case and the de defamation claim that's there. Uh, I don't represent Assistant AG uh, Brian, and I'm going to get his name wrong, Kladzwich. Uh, that's my best effort uh, on his name. I don't represent him. I, I, obviously, there are huge problems. Uh, with the handling of this case. And that's why ultimately the charges were dismissed. Uh, you know, that is relevant context to this case, as I said, but it's really not where, what our focus needs to be on here. We need to focus on, on McCabe and Malton. Uh, and, and in a similar uh, respect, I'll say that while I do represent David Busaka, I'm not gonna stand here and say that everything in this investigation was handled perfectly. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like looking at a case uh, after you try a case, you start thinking, gee, I could have done this differently. I could have done this differently. You know, you put everything under the microscope and there are all kinds of problems that, 
that can be identified. Um, and some of those came to light here. But for, for Busaka and then Shapani as well, um, it's important to understand where they were getting their information from. Uh, and, and in large part, that was this assistant attorney general who was later disbarred um, and, and, and whose conduct basically destroyed uh, the case and any, any merit that it had. Um, they, you know, they, they probably relied too heavily, too heavily on him. I, 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 I didn't, I wasn't the trial counsel in this case. I wish I'd had a chance to depose him. I, he must be a pretty charming guy because uh, it seems like everybody was uh, doing whatever Brian wanted, uh, Kalaja wanted them to do. Um, and my, my client, uh, Usaka, is probably uh, guilty of that as well in terms of trusting him uh, and, and, and relying on him. Um, so, so it wasn't a perfect investigation. I'm not going to say that it was. But let me shift to, to the, the focus of our claims and their governmental immunity defense. Basically, we're dealing with three different, three different issues. There's some overlap between them when it comes to the evidence and what's relevant to them. We ask, first of all, uh, was McCabe, let's start with McCabe, acting in the course of scope of his employment? Um, and then second, we're going to look at whether um, it, there was a law, lawful and enforcement purpose that he was acting on. Uh, and then at, lastly, the actual malice uh, component, uh, whether, whether, uh, whether you know, he was pursuing this for, for a malicious reason. Um, and I think it's important to start by noting that the investigations that we allege he was interfering with, I mean, he really had nothing to do with these. What it was is a classic turf war. He felt they had done their investigation and when, and, and, and I'm not surprised with it, but when he got word that there were, uh, was a search warrant being executed in his jurisdiction, his radar went up, he wanted to know more uh, about that. But it's really the manner in which he went about, uh, about uh, dealing with those investigations, starting with Centerline uh, DPS and, and the contacts he had with them, and then later with uh, the Michigan State Police. He's not investigating anything at that point in terms of the underlying crimes. Let's set that aside. And then second of all, they have said, because there's this notion, and, and I think they even stated in the question presented, that he wanted to ensure that justice was done. Um, I take exception to that because he really was not doing that at all if you look at the questions that he's asking uh, of Centerline. Um, and if you also look at the fact that he didn't, he didn't send over the, the care house reports, he didn't send that stuff to center line or, or DPS one or, or they asked for. It, see, they never they, they were not requested. But to me, if if the inquiry for him, if he's that concerned about ensuring justice, uh, and center line falls out of the picture pretty quickly because it's clear they're not really investigating. It just came to their attention at one point and then moved on to the state Almost police. A mandated reporter type of situation. Yeah. It seems like. Yeah. And 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 so so if he's this concerned about ensuring justice, it would seem that those care house reports, you know, you write a letter and say, I understand you're investigating this. We already did. Here's some information you might Council, doesn't it normally go the other way for a kind of standardized law enforcement deconfliction? It would be the person with the new investigation reaching out to deconflict. Have you I, already looked into? I this? don't disagree with that. I, I, I think that's something that probably should have uh, happened in the handling of this case. And, and as I said, as a, at the outset, yeah, I'm not going to stand here and, and say that the investigation was handled perfectly by MSP. I don't think MSP was, was saying that. Um, and 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 it, you know the, the, those problems are there. But but okay, that didn't happen. McCabe's radar is up. He knows this is going on. He's concerned about it. What is his motivation here? Is it ensuring justice? If so, why isn't he just sending that information on and saying, hey, you guys might want to know about this. I read the police report and, and, and I'm looking at this and, and it seems you don't have this information. In relation to yes. the center line initial contact, uh, how long thereafter is a search warrant executed? Uh, gee, if I had to put it in, in months, I don't, I don't know that I could ballpark it. I, it's probably like, like, uh, it's probably a good six to eight months, I would that think. Was, okay, that was sort of my and, and brother counsel could probably answer that better. Okay. Than I, I know it's your right, counsel. I just, uh, yeah, and, and, and because with Centerline, you know, it, it, it comes to, to, to 
uh, Detective Gerald, you know, and obviously there's some concerns. It, it, you know, it's Macomb. Center Line's not in the county where this allegedly occurred. There's the underlying problems we later learn about with the relationships, et cetera. Um, and, and McCabe's initial inquiries to Mizinski, who's the director of public safety at Centerline, is, is when they had the phone calls and there's some recorded uh, conversations that they had, it's, his, his questions don't seem inappropriate to me. They're, they're, they're you know, hey, what's going on? Uh, why, is it, why is your guy looking at this? That sort of thing. What, where the problem develops is after those conversations occur, he, he, he charts out these questions that he sends on to Mizinski. I think those questions are really important. And most of them are about Detective Gerald. I mean, his sites are pretty squarely focused on Detective Gerald and Centerline at that point. Most of the questions relate to that. But when Mizinski basically says to him in response, you know, you're not really asking any questions here that are trying to get to the underlying facts of this case. Uh, you're really, what you're doing, and I think Mizinski nailed it right on the head. He said, you're looking to blame and you're looking to figure point. And, and, and we took a look at this investigation, but recognized it was out of our jurisdiction and we passed it on to the state police. Your issue is with them and we're not gonna talk anymore. So Mizinski, I think his letter is really important. And the questions are really important because they do relate to Basaka too. He does. And the shift, the, he shifts his focus then because Gerald's out of the picture. Gerald, Gerald didn't continue to do anything at that point. He had done his review, he passed it on to state police. The focus is squarely on MSP and Busaka at that point. But my sense he nailed it. I mean, he's not trying to ensure justice. Uh, he's not. Where is uh, my sense I assume it's an attachment. Some of uh, it is, and I, I, I pulled it, although I don't think I pulled it with the exhibit number. I, I can get you that on rebuttal. I can tell you which 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 one it is by looking. I, I do have the uh, appendix. I can, I can pull up, or maybe Brother Council can assist us with that. Um, I think we both we both attached it. Uh, it's it's a oh here I, I've got it. My I think this is my appendix by, based on the way it's numbered. Appendix one thirty seven, one thirty eight, one thirty nine. And then my Zinsky's letter in my appendix is 140. So those are right there if you if you want to if you want. Yeah. Um, it's always a struggle to know exactly. Oh, Especially with know, this many exhibits. Well, <laughs> and, and, you know, the old school days, you know, we'd have the case file and be and that yeah. was great. And I I remember how to look for those electronically. Yeah. It's a little more challenging I, for I've, my uh, yeah, I've yet to I've yet to figure out uh, how to how to do a, a tablet uh, in, in, in court anyway. Not in court. Um, so anyway, I think I think Mizinski really hits the nail on the on the head there with his comments, uh, and I think they're important because they show they show two things. I mean, is he really acting in the course and scope of his employment here? Well, no, he's not. He's not investigating anything, and this whole perjury thing, the whole perjury stuff, you know that that that's all backfill. Uh, is was he doing an perjury investigation? He never was, but. Any, any suggestion that he was looking at perjury doesn't come up so much later. It's, it's, it's really not there. Um, it's a turf war, that's what it is. Uh, so problems with uh, this, whether it's within the scope of his employment and, and whether there's a lawful enforcement purpose, I think are obvious, but, um, but malice is also, I think, I think evidenced in, uh, largely by those, by those as well. Um, if I could shift focus for, for, for just a moment um, to, to, to Paul Walton, uh, who is a defendant in the case that was brought in Oakland County, because that focuses pretty squarely on the defamation claim. And it's also, that, that case also goes to McCabe. These are interviews that they gave uh, to, the, to the reporter um, after the, the case had been dismissed. Um, and, and frankly, you know, there's a lot in their interview that, that probably is not problematic. I mean, I don't think it's problematic for them to stand up and say, we investigated it, uh, we did these reports and defend, defend the work they did. But where they fundamentally crossed the line is when they leveled the perjury uh, allegations uh, against Basaka. Um, and and, and that, that's, you know, that, that I think is, is clearly where they, they weren't doing a perjury investigation, uh, they weren't, they weren't really in a position to. Uh, they had some conflicts anyway. 
And it was, uh, there was an ongoing investigation at that point by the Kent County prosecutor who had been assigned to do it because MSP wasn't gonna do it internally either to look at it. Uh, and ultimately uh, none of that went forward. Um, there were just, there were differences of opinion in looking at the evidence in this case. And these cases are hard to say, you know, who's right, who's wrong. But fundamentally what the problem was here for McCabe and then for Walton, because he steps in and makes these, these statements that, uh, that Basaka perjured himself. Fundamentally, the, the problem is, is they're, they're, they're out of their lane. They're fighting a turf war uh, when really what they should have done was stood back and said, I don't think there's anything there for MSP to, to, to investigate, but let them do their investigation. I think they'll come to the same conclusion. In fact, we'll assist, we'll send over everything we had so so we ensure that the the result, right result happens that is not his but, focus but this case the, the second generation of this investigation it was so seemingly far outside the the way a you know I think it's normal, but the way it's sort of a routine investigation would begin. I, I mean, what, if anything, Mr. Hicks, do you think impact that has? You know, if, if the, you have these career prosecutors, career law enforcement officers, uh, and, and something goes so far outside of it, you know, I don't mean to speak for Judge Hood, but he and I were both federal prosecutors and other lives. And, you know, you're used to doing these task force investigations, and there's a certain battle rhythm of these things and I don't I, I just does that have any impact on how Mr. Walton and Mr. McCabe uh, responded and the statements that they made I think they're in, they're certainly in a, pos a position and, and rightfully should uh, you know to initially respond and, and reach out to Mazinski and say hey what's going on why is McComb looking at this why is your detective looking at this that's fine um, it's just it doesn't end there they're, they're like you know, a dog with a bone. Uh, they are going to extract some flesh here, and it's going to be Busaka uh, and Shapani, who eventually gets looped into it as well. Shapani's case has some other nuances that are are, are, are not real helpful to her situation uh, because of her relationship with with Kaladzia. Right. Um, so there's there's that that issue as well for her. But I think it really goes to what was the cause of of her getting put on leave, having to grieve, et cetera. Uh, because it all kind of happens at the same time for <laughs> Shapani. The relationship comes out, but but also they're leveling charges uh, at her after the interview, after they have the sit down with the AG's office, there's a follow-up in which they say, listen, Shapani uh, is, is a problem as well. And we're concerned about her testimony at the bond hearing. Um, if I can address that squarely, they quote it, uh, they quote it accurately, um, and, but it becomes this soundbite for the defense that, that Shapani represented that she was the go-to detective for CSC when she worked at Livonia. The question's poorly phrased by whoever was questioning her. They are the ones that use that phrase, go-to detective. But if you read her answer, she says initially yes, which probably she sh should have started out by saying, I wasn't a detective, et cetera. Okay. Mm -hmm. She says yes, but then she goes on to clarify that I was really the only female uh, in that post. So when, when, when sexual assault cases came in, I was usually the one that was going to be involved in doing the rape kits, that sort of thing. So it's very clear from her answer what she's conveying. And the notion that she was out you know, representing herself as the go-to detective on CSC, et cetera. I, and there's an argument to be made for that, but I don't think it holds up. At the end of the day, it's a fact question what we want to read into her testimony. It's not, it's not the, 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 uh, the point that they, you know, the, the key point that they're trying to make it. Um, so so that, that's with regard to, with regard to Shapani. Um, with regard to things that, because that, that, uh, uh, the bond hearing is also one of their big, their big focuses is, you know, uh, the bond hearing, what was the, uh, the affidavit that uh, Busaka prepared and it was you know largely with the influence of of the assistant attorney general um should there have been other things 
uh, included? Perhaps so. Um, I think those are all relevant questions, but I don't know how you get summary disposition on that because it is, you know, there are judgment calls made in terms of what you're going to put in, what, you know, what supports you. And, and I, I think arguably they would have had enough anyway. Um, so the, the, the returning to the, to the perjury uh, allegation that's leveled, this is just another classic example of Malton, in this case, who said it, and McCabe, who's standing with them and also making his own statements about uh, the impropriety of the investigation and the problems with the investigation in this interview, um, they aren't performing a, a function in, in, of, in, of, they never, they weren't investigating these, this case. It's not like they're standing up talking about a case that they investigated. Um, at most, I think they could have gone into that interview but and said, they, I mean, here's they, what we did. But it's not like they called a press conference and said, hey, we're going to talk about this. You know, they, there is an investigative reporter that says, we're running the story. Yep. And what, you know, they, paraphrase. Why aren't you investigating serious allegations of the CSC against kids in Oakland County? Yep. That, that's, you know, and I'm, that's and I'm, a, you know, I don't know if that's exactly what the reporter said. It's, or It's the know. gist. Okay. So uh, then you've got the chief assistant and you've got the i, I think under sheriff right it, it's, under sheriff okay yes yeah so under sheriff and the chief assistant in the prosecutor's office they're designated kind of in yeah. their job description is the they're, again maybe they're the pao they're the public I, affairs I, officer i don't have a problem with them uh, responding to the interviewers questions going on camera saying we investigated it we didn't find it to be credible but thank you very much we're done your, exactly. your position is, hey, they perjured at, at that At that moment, they, well, they accused him. They defamed him by accusing him of perjury at that moment, uh, a charge which they were not investigating. That wasn't anything that, that was within their purview to investigate. They weren't any part of that. They knew it was being investigated independently by, by Prosecutor Becker over Grand Rapids because there were the conflicts. Um, and yet they wanted to throw him under the bus. They wanted to make sure this guy was done. Um, and that's where your malice comes in. So that's where I think the trial court erred. I think there's- Were they required to give uh, Booker uh, advice to uh, litigants that Bukasa had been up, notify litigants that uh, th there was a belief by investigative agents that a law enforcement officer's not been truthful in the past. There, there are certain prophylactic actions that have to be taken by prosecutors when they become aware of that. Did, were, did they do that in this case? I have, I have no knowledge that they attempted to do that. I think it was all about the press conference. Uh, if they did, maybe brother counsel can speak to it, but I'm not aware of, of them saying, listen, I wouldn't use this guy. It's problematic. We don't think he's trustworthy, et cetera. Those kind of comments that were made in the interview might be appropriate in, in some other forum but not in the form that they chose to, to entertain, entertain those comments and, and to make those comments. Um, so that's really the, 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 the argument here. Uh, I mean, there's a tremendous context to this case, as I said before, and, that, and it's not pretty. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in this case that uh, a lot of actors did differently and it's resulted in a ton of litigation Wasted uh, resources. Two minutes left on your prime. Okay. Just, I, I, I'm basically done. Unless the court has any questions on the offer of judgment, uh, sanctions. Uh, again, the only thing I would say is uh, the, the, the Wayne case actually went to case of Al uh, and, and it was accepted. And then the rule changed at the end of the year. Right, but and then that, the offer of judgment's done five months later. Right. I, I do have yeah. one short question on that. Sure. Uh, my lead to others but on the rule change uh and i, I had some familiarity with this I, I was an author of a case we published on the effective date of the then whether it's retroactive or proactive my recollection from the previous case i had addressing this rule change was it uh like all rule changes, it had been advertised well in advance i, I don't know whether it's three months six months or nine months but do you agree that it wasn't like on January 1st, uh, our leaders on the Supreme Court, you know, issued a rule and said, oh, by the way, this is a new rule. I mean, we knew this was coming as practitioners. I think everybody knew case of L sanctions were going away. Right. Uh, only us old schoolers knew 
Let's go right back to offer. Judgment. Right. Of course. Let's, let's start, I actually thought the same. Let's thing. start playing the game again. Because you know? okay. there was always all that gamesmanship when I first. We never did that. Cases. It's like a cunt, but yeah. we <laughs> did offer, make offers. I can't say we never did it, but the, uh, but, but there, you know, there are always, and there are additional arguments that I, I, I've made that I think make the point that uh, the interest of justice exception should apply here because, because of the way it played out uh, in terms of timing um, the fact that everything had finished by then. It's only five months later that they say they have the epiphany. Oh, we can still stick them. Even though they accepted that case when, of that, for, very, the offer, for much higher numbers, accepted the case of that, we can still make something up. And, and the offer of judgment sanctions, do they, is the effectiveness of the costs which are incurred as of the entirety of the case or as of the date that the offer is rejected? I, I believe it's I believe it's the rejection. But that's my recollection. Yeah, with the, with the comment you just made, I thought. Hmm, I, I, I think that's I think that's I think that's right. Although the number is high, right? It's so like sixty six thousand. So I'm wondering why the number is that is that high. I, I would have to think that number. Of course, they didn't get the number because it was denied. Oh, right. It was just okay. the claim. Oh, so you didn't have the, the yeah. So that, we you know, the most we would have would be a remand to figure it out. Um, but so uh, okay. I, I don't know exactly what the numbers Great, are. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Thank you, you have very five much. Five minutes appreciate, for appreciate it. Morning. <clears throat> Morning. Starting off big picture, I think um, it's kind of interesting to think. I can, I just your appearance, please. Sorry, sorry. Robert Clark for uh, the defendants, I guess. Uh, Walton, McCabe, Boca County. Um, big picture in a, in, a, in a day and age when uh, law enforcement is heavily scrutinized, you know, about wrongfully convictions and their actions that lead to questionable convictions and you can't go a day without seeing you know a Netflix documentary pop up about some corrupt law enforcement agency. In this case we have exactly what the public is looking for in terms of McCabe having information about a screwed up mess and he proactively contacts the MSP and Centerline saying, we have exculpatory information in our file. Your officer, Busaka, has never requested it. He's never requested our file. We were never advised that you were going to come into our jurisdiction and start this investigation, which has been the course for our entire relationship. And there's a deposition or some other type of testimony of record that the pattern and practice in that particular county is if MSP is coming in for a felony investigation, they're going to alert the local chief law enforcement officer being either the elected prosecutor or mm -hmm. the elected sheriff. That's correct. Um, because and the, and the testimony from McCabe is that um, the reason why that's done is so you don't have an emergency situation mm -hmm. where you have, uh, you know, Oh, you, mean D, you mean DEA was going doing a search of my informant? That never happened. Right. But, um, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, so the common practice is, hey, before you're going to do a search warrant or anything, you're going to tell us about it. And then we stand down. We'll, we'll provide assistance or whatever you have. In this case, the sheriff's office, who has jurisdiction over Oxford, where this occurred, where the search warrant was first performed, they find out because they get a call from a citizen to the sheriff's office saying, why is MSP executing? Why, why is MSP SWAT in our, our area? It was actually an employee of the sheriff's office spouse. So they're somewhat familiar with the situation. And obviously that gets escalated right to McCabe. MSP SWAT's in our, in our jurisdiction. What's going on? What, you know, when we don't have anything, we don't have any officers out there. Which, and so McCabe testifies, this is the first time it's ever happened in his 40 year plus career. So he's, he immediately gets a hold of, of the people that did the investigation after he calls MSP and he finds out what they're, who they're investigating. He says, we, we investigated these guys twice. We've got a whole file. We've got the victim's mother on a recorded conversation attempting to blackmail the guy that you're doing a search warrant on where you know, we, we got that and we said, this is, this is Crazy. This, this isn't going anywhere. I think appellant would agree with everything you're saying so far. Why didn't, at what point do you diverge? You're, you're both agreeing with everyone along this path. But at a certain point, he says your, your clients crossed the line. 
you say that when, once you cut to the well to, to where the path separates I'll, I'll answer that quite bluntly everything i heard from mr hicks i generally agreed with but there was nothing tortious that that he identified mccabe contacting another police department that didn't have jurisdiction over investigation there's nothing tortious about that these are the only claims that are, are asserted here are intentional tort claims so they're, they're simply put sending a a, a questionnaire to centerline that's not tortious there's nothing tortious about that. Yeah. This, this, the questionnaire that he references reference Busaka two times. I think what Appellant will, will say on rebuttal is that that those questions or that discussion uh, with was the center line? Is that what it was? Yes. Uh, reveal his underlying intent, his motivation. Sure. Was something other than. <clears throat> well, I'll answer uh, that in two parts. Deconfliction. Two parts. First, again, you have to have a tort, you have to have an underlying tort. So if the conduct is not intentionally tortious, it doesn't matter what his intent is. You only get to the you only get to the intent level of governmental immunity if you have an underlying tort, and, and that that conduct alone can't be called into question because it's not tortious. Sending a letter to another law enforcement agency that doesn't have jurisdiction over a particular investigation that, that's not tortious. Right, but do you agree it could be four hundred four B evidence? You know. It, it, it could be if if yes. there is a, an appropriate articulated tort right. that they have established elements on, you know, if you if you accept that, couldn't the giving it frame and context to the evidence so it's either admissible to give background or it's admissible for to show plan, motive, opportunity, knowledge. Sure, I'll, I'll agree. Okay, with that. I, I get that. I think Judge Gibson, to answer the, uh, Judge Cameron's question, uh, hit it right in the head. That it, she said, you know, pretty much verbatim, McCabe was totally within his right to communicate with another law enforcement agency about investigations occurring in Oakland County. So there was no malicious intent because he had exculpatory evidence. That, that's what we have to keep going back to. He has a file that's showing that this guy is potentially innocent, that your guy has had this case, to answer your question, Judge Radford, this case started in November 2018. The search warrant's done in March 2019. That's when the sheriff's office learned of it. So they've had this case now for five months, supposedly investigating it, if you want to believe what Cloje and Busaka say. Never once having contacted, requested a file, haven't requested CPS, who does two investigations, finds there's no no disclosures of sexual assault. I mean, the question, the ultimate question is, what are you doing? You know, so when McCabe, McCabe has all these, look, we've had two experienced sexual assault prosecutors look at this. We've had two CPS investigations, never finding any credible disclosure of sexual assault. And then you get a search warrant, what happened? And then I find out that Centerline is somehow involved. And, and I forget which of you asked the question about this, but you have to keep in mind, McCabe, when he... When he starts talking to Centerline, he gets conflicting information. Um, he had about their involvement. According to Mizinski, Gerald was cold called by Mrs. McMaster, the victim's mother, and she was and he was told that he couldn't and he told her that he couldn't help her. That's what Mizinski said. But then Busaka's police report says that Gerald agreed to review the file and and then provided the file to the MSP. So he was much more involved. So Cave has conflicting information about what Centerline's involvement. He then goes to MS, you know, he's, he's got his conversation with MSP at that point. And what the, uh, what Captain Deasy said from MSP is that all of McCabe's communications were completely appropriate. I thought they were, you know, it should have been the reverse. It should have been us contacting them, not him contacting me. I had no problem. You know, what, what about the statement they did, that they committed perjury? Okay, so that would, that's that's the Oakland County case. Um, and like like your honor asked, um, this is a, I think it's a three or four part investigative story that uh, Channel 7 had been running for quite, quite some time, really since the beginning of the investigation. And so the context of this story is that um, the reporter asked uh, um, Walden and McCabe to sit down for an interview because she's got this affidavit that Busaka wrote. And in his affidavit, he says that during the time that the sheriff's office was doing their investigation, the victim made numerous credible disclosures 
of sexual assault. And so they're asked point blank, well, if you've got this, if, if there were numerous credible disclosures of sexual assault, how did, how did two charge, two warrant charges get denied? And so McCabe says, well, we disagree with it. He, did, he never says perjury directly. He says, we disagree with it. You know, you can't lie as a police officer. That's as far as he goes. Walton says, we think he committed perjury. And it's, in the context is, is important because he's asked in, in the context of, why didn't you charge Mr. Walton? You are the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. If there are numerous credible disclosures of sexual assault, why didn't you charge? He says, we think that that statement is perjury. We think he committed perjury. And the reason why he did that, he didn't just go on the news and say this without any information. He reviewed the prosecutor that reviewed the file twice, says there's no disclosures of sexual assault. That, that was in her memorandum. There's no, no disclosures. He, he reviews CPS that says there's no disclosures. No disclosures or no credible? No credible disclosures. Well, well, CPS even said no disclosures. And so, and then he has on top of that, so he's got that, and then he, he does something else. He does something additional. He has his most experienced child sexual assault prosecutor, Sarah Pope Starnes, to analyze the warrant. Look at the care house interviews. Are there credible disclosures? And she, and her analysis is no, there's not. So the information he has is, look, there's no, there's no disclosure of sexual assault. So in his, in his opinion, he says, we think he committed perjury because his information that he has, that he relied on is that there were no disclosures. And, you know, I think the context again is important. This case was so ridiculous in, in the attempt that the, what happened here is that the initial report came in from Mrs. McMaster, and she said that, you know, the, the victim said that salami was put into her anus. She's forensically interviewed, and the child doesn't even know what salami is. Never said salami. Couldn't, couldn't even come close to her. She says, you know, all positive, glowing things about the, Mr. McMaster. No, nothing negative. And so she says, well, my daddy, you know, uh, the victim says my daddy fixes, it helps you with my rash sometimes. That's, that's, there's no disclosure. You know, through this litigation, they have never been able to say, what is the disclosure? You know, we've got Busaka saying there are numerous credible disclosures. What, just identify one disclosure. They, had, they can't, because there was nothing even close. This case was never even close to sexual assault and just yet to, just guy. to get specific on that i mean you're saying that based on the witness the witness here being incompetent due to age well i mean she was forensically interviewed i don't know if she was incompetent not in, okay I so mean, incompetent in evidentiary terms not incompetent in probate terms but that she's too young to be able to truthfully or say something that's true or something that's false I, that, 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 the forensic interviewers never said that, that at all, and, and the people that reviewed it never said that either. They just said that they, she didn't even identify anything that was even close to sexual contact. I mean, her, she said her dad is fixing her, her rashes sometimes. She did have, have rashes. She said something, you know, at one point she said there was a windmill, and the windmill blew my skirt up, and, and then there was some, some issue with scissors. There was nothing even remotely close. So for Busaka to then say in an affidavit, sworn affidavit, to get a search warrant, there were numerous credible disclosures. It just wasn't close for, for CPS that reviewed it, for the initial prosecutor and then the, and the reviewing prosecutor. So, so again, Walton says, in my opinion, this is perjury. You know, so um, in terms of the, that going to the good faith, whether that statement was made in good faith, it's again, it wasn't something, it wasn't a statement that he made that he didn't have information to support. It wasn't like I, he said, I could think he committed perjury with no basis, with no, with no research done, with no, no, without prosecutors looking into it, without prosecutors telling them that with experience in the field, and there weren't, there weren't disclosures, without CPS who looked at it as a much lesser standard, just a preponderance standard, then so, there weren't, weren't disclosures. Fair to say the information they have at the time that they're making this statement is that based on what they're looking at in the affidavit, they know that there are false statements in the affidavit that are made under oath Maybe there's a question about willfulness, but if you take in the context leading up to the generation of that document. Exactly right. That's exactly, that's exactly right. That's, that's the defense in this case. And you know, I'm, I'm to buttress all of that. 
the district court judge, Judge Kassin, when she looked at it and was, and, and, and was informed, realized that Rusaka did not tell her the, the information, that this was you know, cherry picked from, from the 2006 investigation, she said she never would have wrote the search warrant. So this, this case would never have got anywhere. They would have never even gotten to the home if, if she had been properly advised. It was a district judge. District court judge. She, she got he got the he got the warrant from a district court judge. Right. I was surprised to see an affidavit from a judge. Yeah, she she gave an affidavit in this case um, when, she, when she was provided information. It's, that's where that that kind of came from. Um, so, you know, that's that's the, the my argument um, to to address the the um, Chapani, I guess, um, very briefly the. Attorney General's office did their investigation about whether she committed perjury completely independent of anything from the, from the sheriff's office or for any conversation with Cave. Um, they ordered the bond hearing um, testimony from uh, Shapani uh, while she was in a relationship with Kolojic. Um And was, was that Kolojic, was was that the prosecutor who examined the witness? Yes. So, um, she was in a relationship with the prosecutor that's examining her. Um, the question was, you know, is it true that when you were with um, Livonia that you were the go-to CSC detective? Her answer, first word, yes. It wasn't true. She was never even a detective. And that and that was borne out very quickly in the AG's office investigation, which was subsequently terminated her for, for lying. Um, so uh, that's with regard to Shapani. The... Um, offer a judgment. The only thing that I would, would say is that I think, um, unfortunately, there was some confusion by both trial court judges about the application of uh, 2405 D2. I don't think there's any uh, any question based upon the case law that that doesn't that sub rule does not apply when there's multiple offers, um, which there were in this let's case. A, let's assume that somebody agrees with you on that proposition. Yeah. Why Why doesn't the ends of justice uh, exception apply to this? So. You know, judge um, got to the right result for the wrong reason. So, um, because I think that the, the their argument that the interest of justice exception applies is based upon the value of the case evaluation order. Well, it's based on it, value of the case. It's based on this is a high publicity question about the investigation, the integrity of law enforcement, public interest. I get the it's the. It, I don't know whether Mr. Hicks wrote this part of the briefs. Uh, there are a lot of briefs, um, but it, I got it was sort of the everything put together makes it why this should apply. What, why, why isn't that the case? Because I think that the case law that says that the interest of justice exception, well, one, it's the exception to the rule. Uh, it's, it's not to be you know, used um, frequently, but I think what the, the standard should be in the case law uh, addresses that the ultimate result is really what what dictates whether the interest of it, uh, in it, whether it right, applies. Right, but you, guys, you have a unanimous 180 and 200 uh, case evaluation. Shortly thereafter, the offer judgments are in the 10 to 20 range. I, I, I'm just... And I, I understand, obviously, a, a summary disposition grant is a zero judgment i i i may not be an engineer like everybody else in my family but i can do that basic math you know so but you know yes it, it's uh and, and i mean i did use offer judgments when i was in private practice frequently um as and i hope i was fair about it i'm pretty sure i was um but there is some trial strategy involved when you're doing it so you do a 10 to a 20 and you got this 200 and 180 or whatever it was uh I, i'm I, i'm i can address that yeah so that was the uh what you're referring to is the wayne county case about okay um at the time that that case evaluation occurred uh my office wasn't here retained it was actually uh the corporation counsel was handling it and the Attorney that is having no, I read your brief. You didn't, you had, you don't. So there was no deposition, right? You know, et right. cetera, et cetera. So, but I mean, whose fault is that? Um, you know, I mean, it's like, oh gosh, Judge, the, I remember doing settlement conferences as a trial judge. All oh, that case evaluation is way off, Judge, because it's like, hey, listen, my friend, I've you, you, we've been pals for 15 years and you didn't take depths. You know, too bad, so sad. I mean, how, how well, is that? you know, you know, I, I just. 
that's the, the issue is, and I understand what you're saying. The issue is that basically at the time the case evaluation was done, it, there was no discovery done. You know, so it was just how the allegation. How is that even possible? Um, how, how does the scheduling work? Because that suggests to me that somebody, whoever, the, and I don't know who the trial lawyers were, but I, I mean, how do you try to even do case evaluation without discovery? At least the, the this the is all I'll say. I, I got to be careful about where I'm trending yeah. on this. But there was serious medical issues involved with the lawyer that was handling. It. Okay, well, that, I don't that's even, a reason. That's a reason. Okay, yeah. that's that's you know, and I, I don't. So I don't even know that. Quite honestly, and this is not in the brief, and it just is tangential. I don't even know if a brief a summary was was provided. Right. There was nothing done. I mean, virtually nothing done was in the case. So the. You know, we have these awards. I think anybody that, I mean, I think the um, okay, Mr. Romano's office. Why, awesome. counsel, doesn't that, in the algorithm of ends of justice, should that be considered? Okay, well, you know, everybody, you know, took this case seriously, but we didn't have discovery done. I, I'm just, I, I, obviously, if it's not, my, my wife says, Jim, one of your greatest traits is you're very direct. I go, oh, thanks, honey. That's really nice. And then the next sentence is, Jim, one of your greatest weaknesses is you're very direct. So I, I'm very direct. So, I mean, it's obvious that I've, I've got some questions on this. So anyway, um, okay. Thank you for your responses on that. Thank you. Anything else from you, Judge Cameron, Judge Hood? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. The briefs uh, were uh, voluminous, comprehensive, but very well done on both sides. So thank you. Mr. Hicks. Real quick rebuttal. Uh, big picture uh, with regard to whether there's a whether we have a uh, pled a sufficient tortious interference claim, I just remind the court that uh, there was no summary disposition motion under C8 uh, attacking our, our tort claims. Uh, this is solely about the governmental immunity defense. I, if they want to go there, they had time to go there. They didn't go there, um, and I think it's there anyway. Uh, but I just wanted to make that point up front because the discussion uh, uh, went there. Uh, with regard to uh, a couple of quick points, these are just evidentiary things. With regard to the care house interviews, and this I'm quoting from page three of their brief in the, the Oakland County case. Um, this is uh, Shereen Lynch who worked uh, with the care house. She said that she further stated that AM is just too young and is not credible at this time due to her youthful age, which I think goes directly to the point that uh, that Judge, Judge Hood was making. Um, with regard to... Uh, the questions at the bond hearing of Shapani, I, I thought uh, this was an excellent point that, that I think you made, Judge Redford. Uh, the person questioning her is, Clyde, is, is the problem guy, you know, the, the assistant AG. He's the one that phrases the question. You were the kind of the go-to detective, weren't you? And, and she shouldn't have said yes, but she immediately clarified. They don't ever talk about this. I was the only female on my shift for majority of my time at Livonia. Therefore, a lot of CSCs came to me. Um, so she did qualify that answer. Um, you know, the, the AG, the AG, just to, just so the court, I think you may notice the AG did, uh, did terminate her. Ultimately, there was a reason she got a good job back and she is still, she is still there, but there was that blip in her employment. Um, and uh, with regard to uh, Mysinski and, and, and the questions that are asked, I mean, there's a lot of focus on, on the context of this case. I've talked about that. And, and what is McCabe doing when he's reaching out to center? Look at those questions and think about what Mysinski says in his letter. These questions all go to blame and finger pointing. And why the heck are you in my territory? They don't go to- Was hey, Centerline got... the enforcement agency executing the warrant in conjunction with the MSP? No, no, Centerline's out of it at that point because because and this is there's some confusion about how quickly you know how much Gerald really did and 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 he was buddies with Elijah too. Um, the a, you know he may be it's it, you know, it's it, you're talking about Judge uh, Costin's affidavit being unusual. You know when an avalanche like this comes down the hill and 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 everybody's looking bad, people are going to say yeah. If I, I would have done something differently if I had known that. Oh, and, I, it, and, and just so the record's clear, yeah. I am absolutely making no, I, I hope no negative inference is taken from my comments uh, about the affidavit from the trial court. I do not know that trial judge. I, I am not trying to suggest in any way, shape or fashion 
anything. No, and I didn't. Take, I didn't take it that. No, way. I didn't think it did. But yeah. it's also I've, yeah. I've always Keep found that a transcript looks a little different <laughs> than what I thought I said about five years later. It, it, so it certainly does. But the uh, but I think it's a good example of 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 everybody's running for the hills. Yeah. The story gets really different once you start taking depths afterwards. But my client Osaka and Shapani are acting in real time based on the information available to them. And McCabe is acting in real time. He's not thinking about, uh, you know, what, what Pope Starnes said later and all the things she said about how great the investigation was. He's, if you focus on those questions, he's angry because they're in his backyard and he wants to know who, who's doing this. And he's mad at centerline initially, but then he shifts his focus to Osaka. And I think Mazinski hits the nail on the head. The perjury stuff comes later, and, and, and that's just great. It really is on top of it. It just slam, slam dunks the whole thing in terms of them getting too far out in front. It would have been very easy for them to respond to that and say, we investigated. We did all of these things. We didn't find it credible. You know, she's a very young witness, et cetera. Why do you have to drive the train to the, he perjured himself. Uh, he's not truthful. I would never call him as a witness. Then you've gone too far. Um, so I think that's everything. Yeah. yeah, that's everything I wanted to address. Thank you. All right. All right. Neither Judge Hood nor Judge Cameron have follow-up questions. Counsel, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your comprehensive briefing and comprehensive summations. This matter will be, these matters will all be submitted. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute recess. When we reconvene, we will begin with case number 11. Uh, and then we will, my expectation is we'll go keep going through the entirety of the call. So thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone in five minutes. All right. Thank you. See please. I grew up in Detroit and uh, on Saturday mornings, the TV show would say, we now rejoin our heroes. So we now rejoin our heroes here and uh, uh, joining us now and uh, replacing Judge Hood is our good friend and colleague, Judge Letica. Uh, the same sort of comments I made previously with regards to um, uh, child victims uh, or child complaining witnesses apply. And again, I said in most of our cases uh, today, that, that is the case, including in the next one that we call. So this is case number 11 on panel twos, I'm sorry, panel threes, Detroit, April uh, 2024 docket. And in this matter of people of the state of Michigan versus Kimura, Lon Mai Hodges, 368-197, uh, plaintiff, uh, plaintiff and defendant are both endorsed. This is an interlocutory appeal of decision to McComb Circuit Court in a allegation involving uh, the death of a child in uh, the defendant's statement. Counsel. Thank you, Ms. Lehman. You may proceed. Oh, any, I'm sorry. Anything you want to say, Judge Lettica? I did the, you know, sort of standard comments before. Okay, Judge Cameron, ready? All right, please. Thank you, Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. I would like to reserve five minutes of my argument time for rebuttal. Thank you. Do you um, really need that much? I mean, <laughs> probably it's, not. It's one issue, right? <laughs> probably not. Yes, I, I, I don't think I'll need that much. Um, I don't think I'll need much time at all for argument, to be quite honest. Uh, I have briefed everything um, just to hit the high points. Kimora Hodges was interviewed, interrogated for over approximately three hours. Can but... I tell you, we've all watched it. Yes. Okay. We Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Paused it. We played Paused it. Paused it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I literally had we to call it. Judge Letica Saturday evening and, and Chambers because, as these two know, I was out of state because we had our second grandchild was born. Okay. And so, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, so, I called Judge Letica and I'm like, Annika. I cannot figure out how to pause this and I can't figure out how to go a little faster. Okay. You know, parentheses, dummy, close parentheses. She then explained it. So Judge Letica, thank you. I was able to review it uh, Saturday at the no, court so, chambers in Grand Rapids. Right, so, so what we have, so you know, we all so. know, right? Okay. But it's, a, it's the beginning, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the statement about if, yeah. if mom presses charges against me because I was babysitting the child, then I need a lawyer. And was that a clear and unequivocal invocation? And uh, later on, 
what, about two hours into the, into the interview, um, you know, hey, I need a lawyer or something. I need a lawyer. <laughs> That's Was correct. that clear? None of, ooh, so what? Well, and the third thing I think is it, it, if the statement at 1228, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it, is it a reinitiation? So. Correct. And in regards to the first statement, um, just again, just the high points. The first statement was during the reading of Ms. Hodges' Miranda warnings. She stated when they got to number paragraph four, which is the, the right to counsel, that she would only want an attorney if the mother was pursuing appointed charges. Counsel, right? I believe it was appointed counsel. Yes. yes. If the mother was pursuing charges. Um, obviously, Ms. Hodges was in custody at the time. There's no dispute that Ms. Hodges was in custody. There was testimony that she was in custody, that she was under arrest for the purposes of our of our review. Um, there were no other crimes that were testified about or that she was charged with other than those related to the death of the child. So arguably it was clear that she was under arrest for suspicion that she had done something or potential charges that she was going to be charged. The detective in this case is a seasoned detective. He knew full well what was likely to come and that charges were very likely as a result of her involvement and in anything that was said during that interrogation. So my position is that, and I believe that the case law su supports it, that at that point, approximately 10 minutes into the interrogation, mm -hmm. that when she said, I only want an attorney if the mother is pursuing charges, that that was her request for counsel. Why isn't that conditional? I don't believe it was conditional. I don't believe that it was um, a, a future statement or if she's pursuing charges. I believe that the detective was aware that she was pursuing charges. Um, she was, again, Ms. Hodges doesn't know how this works. She doesn't know how interrogations work. She she was there potentially thinking that she was going to be talking with somebody, but also was aware that she was under arrest. Can I ask you, is this conditional? You'll win this case if two of us agree with you. Is that conditional? I, no, I don't know that it's conditional. I think it's it's a fact. If, if you'll win you this agree, case. You'll well, win this case. I'll win. Well, I'll if win this part. two of us agree with you. I'll win this part if two of you agree with me, yes. And that's conditional. Yes, conditional on two of you agreeing with me. Yes. Right. So so why isn't this condition? I, I need a lawyer if mother presses charges. And I guess it, it could be considered conditional. However, I don't consider it conditional because in my view as the defense, mm. she was going to be charged. There is no if. The the condition isn't there. Detective Hustalakis was aware that she was likely going to be charged. Yeah. A child had had. But she, but she imposed the condition, right? It's not external. She imposed the condition. I need a lawyer if mother presses charges. Right. And I don't know that she. It's not up to mother though. Right. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> right. you know, we all, everybody in this courtroom right. who's a licensed attorney knows that the, the the complaining witness is not the charging authority. It is right. the elected or appointed right. prosecutor. Right. And clearly Ms. Hodges does not know that. Right. So right. we know. And, and it, what's the relevance that. of that? If right. We know that. And a reasonable person really in her position wouldn't know that, wouldn't know that it's not up to the complaining witness. I mean, those of us who have practiced hmm. defense or, or who are familiar with criminal defense are aware that um, most of our clients think that the complaining witness is in charge, not law enforcement or the prosecutor's office. So even if it's, even if we were to assume that the condition that Ms. Hodges placed on her statement, if mother is pursuing charges, it's a, it's an impossible condition because mom isn't going to pursue charges. It would be the police and the prosecutor's office. So it, it's, in my opinion, it's a non-issue. It's a non-argument because at that point, it isn't up to mom. It's up to the police and the prosecutor. And quite frankly, Detective Pusilakis was aware that he was going to be requesting charges. I, I think that we can all agree whether he testified to that or not. There was a child who had passed away. The last person known not at that time. you're right he was in the hospital he was gravely injured at that point um but he was in the last custody of miss hodges and i think that it, it was likely that charges were coming but even if mother didn't want to pursue charges i i think your stronger arguments the next issue so i would agree i'm interested to hearing that um approximately two hours as as your honor indicated um Ms. Hodges at that point said, I just need a lawyer or something. I need a lawyer. It was in the middle of uh, what could be described as an emotional and heated conversation between Detective Pustilakis and Ms. Hodges. And immediately following Ms. Hodges' statement, I just need a lawyer or something. I need a lawyer. Detective Pustilakis then stated, so you want to stop talking. 
period. And then he continued. Where he stated, okay. Yeah. I, I, so, I, either way, I, he acknowledged I, it. Yeah, I, 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 I will tell you, you know, that the recording equipment here could have been better and it certainly would have been helpful if the parties would have agreed amongst themselves what the content is about the part that we're focused on, at least that, that would have been very helpful instead of, you know, watching and rewatching and trying to hear and figure it out. Yes. <laughs> right. But, the recording is not great. I, I agree. It's very difficult to hear. You know, we're not in charge of the sheriff's department and how much they spend on their recording equipment. So. It's an odd angle too. <laughs> yes. From the front. Yes. Know, viewing from the top instead of. The eye in the sky. <laughs> It is an eye too. It's like a, is it yeah. really? It well it looks like an eye on the video. It's yeah, like the circle it, of light. It, it certainly is. Yeah, like a halo like a bird's effect. eye. Um, so it, the point of of my statement was that Detective Husalak has acknowledged mm -hmm. that not only did Ms. Hodges state, "I just need a lawyer" or something, "I need a lawyer," but also acknowledged that she wanted to stop talking. But instead of stopping the interview at that point, his next sentence was, "Ms. Hodges or Kimora, I'm here for you." Maura, listen, I'm here for you. Yes. And it was very obvious that he was attempting to get her to continue talking. She had not reinitiated the conversation at that point. She had made it clear she wanted a lawyer and she wanted to stop talking. And he did not respect that. He did not honor the exorcism or the exercise of that right to stop talking and instead attempted to get her to continue by. So the, to the trial court uh, below, here's the suppression hearing, the Walker hearing, uh, conducts it, issues a 10-page opinion, something like that. It's got a nine-page opinion and uh, says and talks about the testimony of the officer and that basically the trial judge is satisfied that the officer wasn't sure what happened. And, you know, as you said, as we've already said, all three of us have watched that tape. I, I'm guessing a lot of times as far as, the, you know, we didn't obviously, I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly didn't watch the entire three hours multiple times. But I certainly at the salient times went over that many times. I don't think I went over it as many as Judge Ledica did, but I went over it a bunch of times. And I'm just, you know, I, I guess the first question is, what level of deference, if any, is the trial court entitled to with regards to the decision, the factually based aspect of the decision about what the officer, what the officer's motivations, what their testimony was, what deference is that entitled to? And what, you know, why did the trial judge get it wrong? I think it's it's clear that that the trial judge abused her discretion and even looking at the video and her interpretation of what she saw. Um, the three of you have said that you've watched that video multiple times. Obviously, Judge Ledica is very familiar with the statements that were made, the timing and all of those things. And it was very clear that it was an unequivocal statement. Yeah, you may not have 100 percent agreement on that. You may have people who think. I don't think that was an unequivocal statement whatsoever. So that may be your position. It might be another judge's position, but I wouldn't suggest presuming that that is a hundred percent the case for every person who will ever look at that tape. And many people may have looked at it many times and not know. And, and I think in context, and I would value your assessment of does it matter that the defendant Immediately after saying that, it says, you know, when inquired of, what do you want to do? The defendant, one word answer, talk. And then what does she talk about? She circles back to that which she was talking about before. How is that not substantial evidence that what she said was, in fact, unequivocal and that the law enforcement officers were entitled to ask clarifying questions? Thank you. What, what did they say? Unequivocal. Unequivocal things. <laughs> so you, you get where, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, tell me, tell me why that's, why was the trial judge incorrect? The trial judge never should have gotten <clears throat> to the point where the detective said, so what do you want to do? Because it was already unequivocal and unambiguous, equivocal and unambiguous, that at the time that Ms. Hodges said, I just need a lawyer or something, I need a lawyer, that she wanted to stop talking. 
at that point, the case law is clear. When somebody requests counsel, the interview stops until they say otherwise, until they on their own change their mind or say that I want to keep talking. Not after a detective says, listen, Kimora. What, what if they didn't understand? I in, And the trial judge who reviewed and had the testimony presented to that to her in person found credible the law enforcement officer's observations and reaction. I mean, it, what, in, what deference, if any, is the trial court's capacity to review the witness entitled to at our court? I don't think that there should be any additional deference provided to the trial court. Obviously, this I, court- how, how so, though? Because isn't she making an evidentiary determination about the testimony? And isn't it normally an abuse of discretion or clearly erroneous? Right, so right, it's a factual finding. I find the detective's testimony credible that he was, he didn't find it unambiguous, right? So you watch the video and to overturn a court's fi finding of fact, we would have to find clear error, be firmly convinced that the court got it wrong. So we can all watch the video does that factor into it? Um, and a separate question, who are, whose point of view are we looking from? A subject, the officer's subjective viewpoint or what a reasonable objective officer would understand this language to me? Um, so to, to kind of piece that out, the, the first question is, looking at the video, hearing what the judge, the judge's opinion was and her opinion in order. And then was there an oral opinion at all? No. Okay. I didn't think so. No, I get, I sure no, she it. just, um, she just said that she would issue a written opinion, okay. which and we received some time later. Right. Correct. Okay. Which is what you all have. Um, <clears throat> in regards to clear error. Yes. The judge was in the courtroom and heard testimony and watched the interrogation video as you all did the, the portions that were that were um pulled out um and were cited by the prosecution but did she hear the testimony of both the defendant and the officer she did okay. yes she heard the testimony of both of them that that same day um the video is clear and i it's my position and my argument to this court that the video is what creates the clear error or the abuse of discretion by the trial judge. It is clear on the video that what Ms. Hodges says, it is clear on the video how that message was received by Detective Pustilakis in the moment. And he acknowledged that Ms. Hodges requested counsel. He acknowledged that, that, that his duty was essentially to stop the interview and said as much, you want to stop talking, which is clear. He understood what that was. He understood what her statement was. He understood that that was an unambiguous assertion of her right to counsel. This is what is in the court's opinion. Answer, yeah, this is the officer. She said it all in sort of one breath. And when she stated, I, needed a, I need a lawyer or something, it's sent to me. I interpreted that. I wasn't clear as to whether or not that was a hard, you know, I'm done talking, an unequivocal statement of I'm done here. I don't want to answer any more questions. To me, I interpreted that as she wasn't certain, but she was contemplating ending the conversation. So I followed up, I'm sorry, I followed that up to get clarification. That's what he testified to. That's what he testified to. but And, and that's what the court gave credence to. It is which is where I think there's error in the judge's decision. So clear. So is the review that we are required to perform, is it that that was clearly erroneous, that the trial court's conclusion that that testimony was credible is the standard of review clearly erroneous? Abuse of discretion. Oh, abuse of discretion. Okay. All right. So... But in that argument, or I'm sorry, in that the judge's review of that testimony, also reviewing the video, mm -hmm. which she had the opportunity to mm -hmm. do, 
the court is able to see that not that Ms. Hodges didn't just say, I need a lawyer or something. She unequivocally, unambiguously said, I need a lawyer. That was it. That was the second part of the statement that Detective Hustalakis didn't talk about in that portion cited by the trial judge. That that was the unequivocal statement to which he followed up immediately with, okay, so you want to stop talking. And then followed that up with, listen, Kamara, I'm here for you to encourage the conversation to continue instead of stopping the conversation. Is that the, is that the functional equivalent of interrogation? I would say so, yes. The prosecution in its brief says it's not express, but they never address is it the functional equivalent. And um, following up on that, back to the other point, are we looking from the officer's subjective of her statement or are we looking at what an objective law enforcement officer would understand that statement to be? What an objective law enforcement officer would understand that statement to be, not just what Detective Hustalakis thought. We know what Detective Hustalakis thought, but that's not the- Well, we know we, what he testified. Right, to right, <laughs> right. Which I which I would argue and, and, and right. say is different than what he actually thought in the moment um, based on what we can see in the interview, in the interrogation. Um, so I, I really think that that's the crux of my argument. I, I think that, that I don't really need any more time other than that, unless there are additional questions. Oh, there's the- Does she reinstitute? Right. <clears throat> there was the discussion that there was some sort of a reinitiation of conversation. I think it's very clear that a spontaneous comment about something, even if it is related to the, to the interrogation, is not a reinitiation of conversation. Ms. Hodges was very clear that she didn't think that that was a reinitiation. She had no idea that, um, by making a comment as she did that wasn't supposed to happen and he follows up his with what is that what do you think that is right which is after she had already said that she wanted a lawyer but and he I acknowledged that there's, so there's no right so and, and again i i i my position and the defense position is that she didn't reinitiate conversation by making that statement she wasn't asking about well what's going to happen next what what are you going to do um, what happens if I don't keep talking? There was nothing like that. She wasn't inquiring into the detective about what the next steps were, what was going on with the investigation or anything along those lines. She was simply making a statement, which again, should not have even come out because the conversation should have ended. The detective should have left the room when she asked for a counsel. So the requirement that she independently reinitiate? Yes. Based on my review of the case law, I, I'm not seeing anything where it says that, that law enforcement because again, once the once the initiation or the exercise of, the, of that right is made, the conversation ends. So counsel can't the then come back. unequivocal exercise of the right. Right. Um, I guess there's some case law that says that some time can pass before law enforcement can come back, but that's not the situation here. Okay, so let me ask this. Does the case law, and do you have any that says there is a break that's required in the inter interrogation for before there can be reinitiation. It actually has to stop. Like this just seemed to, you know, evolve, right? Yes, and I do, um, I, and unfortunately I didn't bring any with me. I can look and, and provide some on rebuttal because I have briefed this issue um, on a prior case, but there is case law that supports um, that a break is allowed and, and that the break, law enforcement can take a break and come back. So what about, <laughs> so, the trial court here relied on an unpublished opinion that said, um, which, you know, I, I, I have my questions about that, which, in which the language was, I need a lawyer now. And that, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, as we started the beginning of this conversation, I don't know how much defendants know what, <laughs> what they have to say to invoke but it seems to me I need a lawyer is one of those clear ones that doesn't need further explanation. I would agree um, with you. Yeah. But what about this unpublished case that she relied on? And, and that was the language and that, that one also evolved and it turned into <clears throat> the defendant, uh, although not all of that conversation was quoted, apparently that defendant went back and forth between maybe I need a lawyer, maybe I don't need a lawyer, well, uh, I don't, or I don't want a lawyer. And now I'm to, I want a lawyer, but I'm going to talk, continue to talk to you. 
And I think, Your Honor, that was what the point was that I was going to make, was that in that case, that defendant said, I want a lawyer, but I'm going to keep talking. And, and said that on his own. They said, do you want to stop talking? He said no, because he had been so back and forth in the conversation and during the interrogation, it arguably was an, an ambiguous assertion of that right. right. But your client had been talking for over 90 minutes. I, it was not exactly a linear process. I mean, this was a... Um, there was a lot going on, a lot of tangents, a lot of explanations, a lot of things uh, that I, I don't know what happened in the Messman case, but I, I accept your variation, your uh, recitation of, of what it is. But it's not as if Miranda rights are given, signed and waived, no non-direct communication everything's direct answer question question answer question answer question answer and 15 minutes later the the person being interviewed says i i want a lawyer i mean this was a very fluid uh situation and that's why i the supreme court of the united states has talked about the capacity to allow law enforcement to ask follow-up questions for clarification and when a trial courts who hears the testimony of both the, the defendant and the officer says, I, it was not clear. I mean, what, why isn't that correct? Why isn't that correct? Is that why isn't it correct? Why didn't the trial judge make the right ruling here? Why do you think, what it, you're understanding that, you know, I, I guess my point is if this were two, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes into the discussion, very linear, no, no confusion. This was a confusing interview. This was a, complex human tragedy that was being discussed between these two people. And I, I don't know, I just, I, I don't think it's as simple as you say the words, I want a lawyer in the context of what was said before and in the context of what was said after. I don't, I, I'm not entirely sure why there aren't why people can't ask a follow-up question. What do you mean? I mean, I, I think of dinner conversations with my children. I love my children more than I love myself, but I don't, you know, they're in their thirties. I'm in my sixties. I, I don't always understand them, you know? So I, what, what do you mean? You know, and it's not because they're not super bright kids. They are, uh, but I, I don't know. It just. Is this rule a bright line rule? I, yes, it is. I, I think that when, Somebody who's being interrogated by law enforcement says, I want a lawyer. I need a lawyer. Okay. That there can be a follow-up question, but there was in some ways, there was that follow-up. So you want to stop talking. Okay. So you want to stop talking. Look, Kamora, I'm here for you. And then he proceeds to ask if she wants to keep talking. But when he said immediately following her court, her statement, I need a lawyer. He did follow up and, and acknowledge, so you want to stop talking. She didn't say, no, no, I don't want to stop talking. I, I'll keep talking to you. I, I didn't know what that meant. She didn't say that. She had the opportunity to do that, but she didn't say it. Instead, he made the comment, so you want to stop talking. He followed up with, look, Kamora, I'm here for you, to encourage her to keep talking, and then eventually said, so you, so do you want to keep talking? And, and I believe at that point she responded yes, or, or something similar in the affirmative talk, right? Talk. You know, do you want to stop do? or do you want to talk? talk? What do you want to do? Right. Talk. And, and again, right. after, after, after a pushing, whole bunch of nudging, back and forth. Yes. Yeah. Said, I'm here uh, again. I'm here. I'm a neutral party in this. I'm here to, so you can get this off your chest. Right. To encourage her so, to keep talking after she'd already said, I want counsel. And this just goes to show Good point. Oh my gosh, Annika, thank you. Yeah, I think you're at that. <laughs> thank point. you, Judge Lodica. Okay, yeah, good save. <laughs> thank you, thank honor. you very much. <laughs> good morning, Your Honors. Jonathan Mysek on behalf of the people in this matter. Um, so now you know where it's at. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And so ultimately, what? I rely on my brief, and I, I'm more interested in your questions, Judge. No, no. Yeah, I, I mean, I so, think I think you've yeah. done them all. I mean, it, it, it is 
you know. What is it an objective or a subject of test? I mean, Judge Ludic has asked that, and I think counsel, uh, Ms. Lehman, has responded eloquently. Uh, I wonder what the people's position is. And is it a bright line rule? It, and should we publish? Ultimately, I think that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly with, with regard That's to publishing, question. I That's leave that to you. Your yeah. Lord, your to your Lord itself. As far as the, whether or not um, it's a, uh, asking for an attorney is a bright line rule, absolutely. I think that I can agree with counsel that if, if an attorney, if a, if a client says, yes, I want a lawyer, and that is the constant refrain, even when the defense. Why does it have to yeah, be a constant, yeah, why constant refrain? refrain? Well, I'm not saying that it has to be, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying that if you, that even after the officer asks any follow up questions to be sure that that is, in fact, the case if there is any ambiguity well, given the context okay of, so yeah that, i mean there are two different tests right edwards is a bright line rule and then you have davis which if it's not if, if it if it's the officer can ask clarifying questions if it's unclear what about the merge yeah and and uh, again is it objectively or, or, or is it subjectively? Is it subjectively? What did this police officer say? And and if it's that, what's the ramifications of our review? If it's objective, what are the ramifications of our review? Well, ultimately, um, that what we have here is the understanding um, of the officer who testified, and so I think that from that perspective, we have to take this almost as a sub, uh, you know, to take this subjectively, because if the context of the situation matters, then we have to look at this from the perspective of the officer at the time, whether or not he was confused in order to determine whether or not that his follow-up questions were, uh, 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 were appropriate for the context. And ultimately, from that perspective, then again, um, when the court makes it, when the, when the, when the trial court made its determination, then again, we're looking at this from through the abuse of discretion standard uh, with uh, eye for uh, uh, any uh, findings that are clearly erroneous based off of or heard, excuse me, uh, based off of her in, based off of her credibility assessment of the officer. And then obviously if there's anything that the officer said that it, that stands in, uh, stark contrast to what is evident in the video. If he says, well, I was confused given um, something that the victim or something that uh, the suspect said, and I you know that, that didn't happen, for example. So I, I was gonna just jump in, it's turning to these facts. When she says, I just need a lawyer or something, that's in my mind, clearly, uh, not a clear invocation of a right to counsel or something. Correct. Okay. I need a lawyer. A reasonable officer, officer hearing, I need a lawyer or something else, or I need a lawyer. That's a lot going on. That's correct. No doubt, in my opinion, the officer here would have been well within his right to ask for immediate clarification. The problem I see that you have in this case is that he didn't. He said, okay, a recognition that he heard what she said and then goes in a different direction and then turns it back around. As I see it, that's the problem you have in this case. Uh, I have no problem concluding that the, I just need a lawyer or something, I need a lawyer is unclear enough in, in my mind to require a clarification, a reasonable officer in that situation would say, what are you saying here? Do you want something? Do you want a lawyer? What are, what are you saying? As I see it, that's your problem, that he said, okay, goes in a different direction. How do you respond to that? That's what, in my mind, that's what this case turns on. And I think the judge that, that when it comes to it, when he says, um, okay, um, and he says, um, I'm here for you, um, he previously testified that his style of interrogation is to build a rapport um, with the individual, with the suspect. And he, he doesn't come, I think he used the phrase something like, I don't come in all Hollywood style, that he doesn't bang the table. That's what he was meaning. And so this isn't necessarily a point of saying that he is trying to encourage her to continue um, talking substantively about the matter. But as a, I would agree with counsel that this was a, emotionally charged situation. And 
I would argue, Judge, that he's trying to get her to calm down so that he can make the to, to stop to, to, crying. Because got, at that point, she's crying and saying uh, to me, I need help. I need a lawyer. You told me I could have a lawyer at any time during this conversation. And I mean, you know, I, I can say in my head, hey, today I'm going to go to the beach or to the store. I'm going to go to the store. Does that need clarification? No, Your Honor. Okay. That's it. So, I mean, to me, that's how I read this statement. I need a lawyer or something. <laughs> in my head, I need help. I need somebody to help me. You told me I could ask for a lawyer at any time. And then you say, you follow it up with, I need a lawyer. But regardless if it's, if it's all in one breath. And then he acknowledges. <laughs> and I know you said the test was um, subjective, but um, I, I, I actually believe it's an objective inquiry under uh, Supreme, United States Supreme Court authority. And so looking at that, I, you know, thousand of these interviews, when, when a suspect says, I need a lawyer, or I want a lawyer, <laughs> you stop. You say, I can't talk to you any, you've invoked your right to a lawyer, I can't talk to you anymore. That's, that's the way it goes down, right? But like I said, ultimately, it's a question uh, that I, again, the only argument that I can uh, that I can submit then is that he's not, in, as I said, he's not trying to encourage or he's trying to get her to calm down to find out at least what the other, what the or something is, because she says I need a lawyer or something. And <laughs> given the situation. I need just, a lawyer, but followed right, up with I, I need, need a lawyer. lawyer. So to the extent that there is any ambiguity. But that doesn't right. But even with the follow up, that doesn't necessarily rescind anything that she previously says. I need a lawyer or something. She needs. A, she says she needs a lawyer because or something. And now oh, I made up my mind. I need a lawyer like me. I I I'm, I need to go to the beach or the store. I need to go to the store. But uh, but ultimately that she didn't ultimately she did not end. But she, she about where I'm going to go. Potentially, yeah. I think so because because ultimately. Given that there is two, that, that as she says that she gives two options that she needs the lawyer or something, then she follows it up with "I need a lawyer." That's I don't necessarily think that that's def, that's a definitive coda to what her intentions are. I think that there because she said that I need I have this something out there. That's something that the officer has if the she ability. To stop there. I'd agree with you. I agree that maybe that needs clarification. Yeah. Well, you know, whether whether it's whether it's unequivocal or whether it deserves clarification, the attempt at clarification, in my judgment, was not sufficient. And he never, you know, and I know he testified at the hearing that he for about, you know between staying silent and asking for an attorney. He never mentioned, I, I mean, if it's in the transcript or in, in, I never heard him say lawyer or attorney after that point. I heard him say talk. <coughs> and recognizing that invoking your right to an attorney ends the conversation. <laughs> but to me, it's not the same thing when you're, when you're talking to a lay person. So let's see where. Oh. I figure out the understand what's right. the path. And I think perhaps that it, that it, that it, that it, that we're, that it could be in terms of um, that even though the even though he's not asking even though he doesn't say uh, continually ask do you want an attorney but he asks he wants to talk if anything that's putting it in term in in a, in a lay person's terms because it's clear that he's already made it made it made. That by talk, continuing to talk to him, I was waiving my right. However, that was all. However, that was already um, that that that, that was uh, clearly indicated in the signed Miranda form that she stated that she had reviewed and that she understood. I, 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 I believe so. Yes, and ultimately, um, it's a, and so 
I would I would argue that he's putting it in that even though he even though the officer doesn't say you can have you can have the attorney, but he puts it in terms that she can under that 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 that, that, that she's comfortable with as far as willing to talk, would continue to talk with him or not. Putting it in terms those are of two separate rights, right? The right to remain silent and the right to have an attorney. That's right. get it there you know it intertwines when you you know i respect that and we'll get you counsel and Uh, again, I, I, and so I, I, as I indicated before, I rest on my brief. Any other questions? Nope. Sure. Um, as far as the reinitiation goes, um, that based off of uh, the questions that um, Judge Letica you had with, uh, 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 at the council. Functional equivalent of questioning. Or listen. I'm here for you. No, I don't believe that it is because we're not again. We're again within the context of this of this inner of this interrogation. Again, it's that they're that he's not asking questions about the substance of the case. I, as I've indicated, he's he's not. I don't believe that the I testimony it's not express right. I mean, quote's not express interrogation. Right. Didn't say I want you to tell me more about what happened. Right. Correct. And so, is it the functional equivalent? I, I I don't believe that it is, because again, we're not that we're not asking about substantive materials, um, we're, we're related, related to the case. Related to the case, if anything, regardless, uh, as I've pre previously um, stated to the court, that it's the situation where he's made, he's attempting to maintain the rapport to attempt to clarify what was previously said. Okay, so when exam took place in this case. The first two hours of the tape. I would have to double check the uh, transcript. No, you don't have to check it. I, I mean, I, I thought it was interview, but you're only agreeing to play the first two hours because you know there's going to be this challenge coming down the road. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that 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 if the video if a por portion of the video if only a portion of the video was played i wouldn't necessarily agree that it was for any for it, it was for any nefarious purpose to avoid oh, no putting no on no, the no i'm not no issue. i'm not implying i i'm just i'm just saying that there was a recognition that this was you know going to be challenged right and, but, and that's clear i think from the exam transcript right. so yeah. Thank you. All right, counsel, thank you. Uh, counsel, you remember what I said about two or more people, what happens two or more people here agree with you. <laughs> That's right. I do. I do All remember. Right. Thank All right. you. All right. Um, I just wanted to, to, I indicated to you, Judge Letica, that I believe that I briefed an issue um, on reinitiation or contact and whether or not there was a time. The issue that I, <clears throat> excuse me, the case that I was thinking of was actually rereading Miranda and the break between initiating, or I'm sorry, exercising a right to counsel and when Miranda had to be read and that there was a break, it was not the same issue. So I wanted to let the court know, I have not been able to, to find cases to cite to the issue that you were asking about. Um, I just, if there were any other questions, I don't know that I have any response. I, I think that the issues are clear. I think you both have framed the issues quite well. Yeah. So, Thank you. So Thank you, Your Honor. This matter will be submitted. Thank you. Next case is case number 12, uh, Keith Devin Dozier versus Kayla Maria Howell, case 366894. Uh, Spillman was endorsed. Good morning. Amy Spillman on behalf of the defendant appellate, Kayla Howell. This appeal challenges the. Sorry, hold on. I'm sorry. Sir, you are? Keith Dozier. Okay, you may have a seat, sir. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your letting us know. All right, counsel. Thank you. This appeal challenges the trial court's March 2023 order changing legal custody from joint to vesting so, sole legal custody with father and modifying parenting time so substantially that it amounted to a change in physical custody 
the mother's parenting time was not only reduced uh, from 275 overnights to nearly 87 overnights, but the character of the child's time with the mother was uh, substantially changed from being primarily in her care to uh, converting the mother to an every other weekend parent during the, uh, during the school year. The trial court's opinion is um, silent about this major change. It ordered a change in legal custody based on what I consider a faulty analysis of the best interest factors and reversed the parenting time schedule that the parties had followed without any analysis at all on how that change impacted the child. And I believe that this <laughs> ignores the holdings of the Vodvarka and Lieberman cases. So the trial court did some other um, things that were odd or unusual in my opinion. Um, it sought out facts and evidence beyond what was admitted into evidence at the evidentiary hearing by improperly quoting an excerpt of a letter from a therapist that was not admitted into evidence, but had been <coughs> quoted in a front of the court recommendation. Neither party called the therapist to testify or sought admission of a letter, but the trial court relied on it to conclude the child was mentally unhealthy. And this court ruled in Kubler that the front of the court reports are not, and in other cases that front of the court reports are not evidence unless the party stipulates to their admission. Trial court referenced factual assertions and pleadings on issues that the parties didn't testify about. The, um, the case law makes it clear that pleadings are not evidence. The court engaged in speculation about mother's motivations for moving to Saginaw. And the trial court made um, numerous factual errors, in my opinion, that impacted its view of the, of the evidence, including the number of PPOs that were issued, the manner that the PPOs were issued, the number of school changes, bless you, um, confusion about the father's parenting time schedule and his ability or inability to exercise parenting time after mother's move, and errors about his homeownership. I believe it was a confusing lower court record. It was impacted by COVID delays. And um, father and mother, they both filed uh, multiple motions um, and father's brief uh, pleading sometimes contained significant factual inaccuracies. Um, it is clear that the trial court um, very much disapproved of Ms. Howell's move to the Saginaw Midland area and um, enrolling the child in school without father's consent. And I believe that this inordinately affected her view of the, uh, the case of the trial court, uh, trial court's view of the case. I believe the findings of proper cause, change of circumstances, the finding of the established custodial environment and the best interest factors are against the great weight of the evidence for the reasons in my brief. And I'm not gonna go into those, but I did wanna draw the court's attention to one case um, that I did not cite in my brief. It is an unpublished uh, Court of Appeals case, Greenway v. Safranoff, docket number 364507, which was issued in uh, July, July 27, 2023, which involved facts that were very similar, but I didn't cite it because the outcome was not uh, helpful to my case. Um, like the father in this case, the father in Greenway had weekend parenting time only during the school year, alternating weeks in the summer. The mother, like in this case, moved around several times, changed the child's school enrollment, although those moves were more than 100 miles, um, and uh, she was pursuing employment opportunities. I didn't cite it because the Court of Appeals um, confirmed what the trial court did, which is change legal and physical custody from mother to father, primarily because of mom's history of moving and making unilateral decisions about school enrollment. But last Friday, April 5th, the Michigan Supreme Court issued an order that reversed the Court of Appeals, vacated the trial court's order, and found that the um, best interest factors, or several of the best interest factors, clearly preponderated in, the, in a different direction, in a more equal fashion, and that the trial court's findings were against the great weight of the evidence. And the takeaway that I, as I see it for this case, is that the singular fact of a party's uh, moving and even violating the other party's legal custody rights should not eclipse or supersede all the other facts in the record of the case. There is plenty of record evidence uh, here to support the finding that- uh, What was the name of that case, please? Greenway v. Safranoff. C-R-E-E-N. W-A-Y. S-A-F-R-O-N-O-F-F. -F. 
Um, there are there are other facts in this case besides just the fact that mother moved um, from Livonia to Saginaw um, that uh, to support a finding that she is more disposed than the father to guide the child in her education and provide for her educate her medical needs to that she did provide a stable home that moving does not mean she's not stable and uh, that father's history of aggressive and disrespectful conduct was more relevant to his willingness to uh, encourage the relationship between the child and the mother uh, than mom's moves uh, in a particular geographic area um, impacted uh, in part by uh, COVID. Uh, the Michigan Supreme Court order is in my opinion instructive to how I would ask this court to rule, um, which I would respectfully request that the uh, trial court's opinion be vacated and uh, the initial order be reinstated or alternatively that the um, court remanded for additional uh, additional uh, hearing. And with that, I'm just open to questions. No questions. Thank you. Uh, matter will be submitted. And uh, Mr. Dozier, thank you for being here. So thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So matter submitted. <clears throat> All right. Next case is... Um, Dan Washova versus uh, Monroe County Drain Commission. It's our case 365140. Okay. The building tilting. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. My name is Larry Van Washington, appearing on behalf of the appellant in this case. And I would like to save approximately five minutes for rebuttal if I could do that. I'm not even going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I learned my lesson. <laughs> uh, let me just ask you uh, we have three. Council, brother council on the other side of the courtroom and the other side of the V. Uh, are we hearing from all three of you, gentlemen? Your Honor, we have discussed that. Bill, now on behalf of the So, and then, sir, you are? Okay, so is that a correct statement? Uh, it is, Your Honor. You might hide. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of pressure on me, Judge. Right. And okay. uh, uh, all counsel, we, we have had the chance to review uh, all of your pleadings and uh, look at the 1904 and forward uh, plats of this part of our important state that we wrestled away from Ohio after the great border wars. And uh, we're uh, very happy to hear whatever comments you have, but we do, I think, kind of get the, the basic claims, but please proceed. Yes, and I, I believe this, it is quite straightforward that you said. We brought an action under the drain code in the current version of the drain code is 280.322, but that was the same 1897 as the judge pointed out in way back. And it basically says that uh, if you're going to construct a drain in this state, what you have to do is several things, but among other things that if the drain crosses a public highway, then the road commission must construct a bridge Albert or Ford across that so that among other things in this particular case, the farmers can tra traverse that and get to their land. Uh, us, and then it indicates that uh, in addition to that, if you can, can your client access all uh, tillable 
portions of his freehold? Without the bridges, no. So the other side has falsely represented the record because the, it's replete with the farmer can get to his farming fields and he has for years. And I think the judge found otherwise because they indicate that these are parcels. They're correct. That if you look at the SID ID numbers, there's two parcels. Right. But if you look at where the bridge goes across, it's basically what he did is the farmer basically had a chunk of land like this. Right. It's long and skinny. In the early 1900s, the people to the west determined that it would be nice to have drains. So the Drain Commission has a right, if they get petitioned, to petition the court to construct drains, condemn that property that they need to construct a drain and drain it. So they put one like right here. Say the house is right here. They've we got, we got all this. Okay. Yeah. But so that, but my question is, can he use the land? Is it farm? So let, me, let me ask me if you don't mind. Okay. Let me ask the question a different way. This chunk of land that's in dispute, is it farm? It currently is farm. How do how do they get equipment to farm that area? They went Don't across the bridges. Pardon me? They went across the bridges. What the condemned bridges? The condemned bridges. And they're still doing it. They are. The problem is it's getting worse and worse. Now there's holes in the bridges. The guardrails are completely gone. And the piers are deteriorating. So it's a situation where if this continues on, there will be no bridges. There'll be nothing for them to go across. They have no other option. It's, prox it's approximately about 40 to 50 acres of property. You can't just let that lie idle. You have to take your risk going across there. Are you risking life, life, your property, whatever not the case may be? Yes, you are. Because again, at some point, the holes are gonna get so bad that they have no other option. Now, can they, go across the bridge. There's nothing that says they can't go across the bridge because if you look what happened with the road commission, the road commission said, we're condemning this pursuant to 257, MCL, 257, 726. And that basically says that the road commission has a right to close that road to commercial traffic, okay? But section, and it says subject to section four. Section four says, this does not apply to farm production items, anything that's to do with agricultural. So they have a perfect right to go across there and they are exercising that right. What I'm saying and why we need a writ to get it uh, to be repaired is because that is not always going to be the case. But you're asking for the, as, the, as we all remember from uh, civil procedure in our first year of law school, the extraordinary remedy of a writ of mandamus that for a public official who has, it, it is to uh, exercise a non-discretionary task. It is ministerial in nature. Whether it's the funding, whether it's where do we prioritize taxpayer dollars, which is a subset of the funding, whether it's who should be the engineer, where should it be placed, how is that any, how is this a, an appropriate cause of action for a writ of mandamus? First question. Second question, even if it is, how has the statute of limitations not expired? for the remedy which you seek. Right, good points. Judge, I would first say that, let's go on the second point first. Okay. The statute of limitations. When does the statute of limitations begin to run? That is the key question. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree. And, the, and it start, they said it started running when they closed the road. What, when did they close the road? They closed the road pursuant to 257.726, which basically says we're doing this closure with commercial traffic, and it says this does not apply to the agricultural section, okay? So at that point, okay, they can close the road all they want, and it has nothing to do with us. And we freely admit that the road is one thing, the bridges are another thing. Because the drain code just basically says you have to maintain, you shall maintain the bridges. It doesn't say you have shall maintain the road. Don't have to do that. You just shall maintain the bridges. Because again, if you stop and think about it, I think the logic to this is that, look, this guy had a piece of property. He farmed it contigu contiguously. 
Okay, now the state has come through for the good of the public and cut it in three pieces. It's only fair, if you want to look at it that way, that he still continue, be able to continue to farm all his property. In statute of limitations, again, it's only going to run if they were to say, look, we're not going to do that because again, here's your notice. From now on, we're not going to maintain it. We're going to say, pursuant to the drain code, we're no longer going to comply with that. If you look at the uh, transcript, however, even at January 16th, the road commission would say, we still have maintained it. Although the interrogatories point out that they agree that they did not maintain it. What statute of limitation does apply to your claims? I think that I don't know exactly. And I think Mr. Uh, Han has it right. There is some statute of limitation, but the key is when does that begin to run? So in your mind, when does it begin to run? When does it begin to run? Correct. And it what is the date that the statute of limitations, what wrong for which you seek relief, what is the, the month, day, and year that it began? It has to begin when I can show. I don't need well, an explanation no. of what a, an event is. I want to know precisely, please, what date in the Gregorian calendar did your statute of limitations commence? July of 2022. July what? 2022. July what? When the interrogatory what date? What date? So during the month of July, the month of July, I don't. I, what What is the, the triggering, mechanism, triggering mechanism? When they admit that they have failed to maintain that bridge pursuant to statute, and it was only six, about five to six months after we brought the action. Thank you. So I think and what is the statute of limitations? One year, two years, six years, a hundred years? I don't know. There's a broad statute of limitations that says 15 years. I don't know if that's the one to be applied or not. I, I don't know. But either case, if it's one, two, whatever, not, it doesn't matter because we filed in February. We didn't get that proof until July. So the statute of limitation begins to run when I can show or somebody can show that they have failed to maintain that structure pursuant to statute. Not when they close the road. We don't care when they close the road. That's a red herring. They can close the road all they want, okay? The other duty that they have is to maintain the bridge that the farmer who has property can then can use it. That's all we're saying. It doesn't say we, and it's not discretionary, so shall maintain. So this drain, yep. does it run parallel to or perpendicular to the former road? Perpendicular. Both of them. They both cross. They both cross, cross the road, road at an angle. It's on exhibit one, I think, of uh, road conditions. Google map. But what we're asking, we think that that was the error that the judge committed. And based upon that, we're asking that that be reversed in that summary disposition, which it came under summary disposition because we brought it, but they brought it under I-2. And then the grant, judge grant under I-2. We're asking that that be reversed and that instead that summary disposition be granted in our favor. And the judge has already run, in, run over the requirements for written and Damus have found that to be the case. So I just would reserve five minutes. Okay, that's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, your honors. Again, may it please the court, Bill Hen on behalf of the Monroe County Road Commission. Um, <clears throat> I'm certainly more interested in questions the, that you have than what I've prepared. I think it's a relatively straightforward case. I think there were two issues. One is the statute of limitations. The other is uh, even the propriety of seeking mandamus in a case like this. The circuit court uh, dismissed on the basis of um, the statute of limitations, but I would submit that either basis is adequate to affirm uh, the result in the circuit court. Um, Why, uh, 
Okay, so you have a landowner, forget that it's this plaintiff, but it, their their property is, this is an exact proportional showing of the square that the person owns. There are two drains that are put in that separate the property. It's an agricultural piece of land. It's been farm generation. Do you agree that the Drain Commission Act of Michigan requires that you have a, uh, if you put, if you run drains perpendicular to the property lines, you must provide access to the um, now separated pieces or acreage in the lot? The drain code states that uh, when a drain is created, if it bisects a, if it bisects a road, there's two provisions. One has to do with roads. One has to do with drains that bisect land that, that doesn't have a road. Right. Um, but with respect to the road, if the drain crosses the road, then the drain district is charged to actually create whatever crossing is necessary. And then after that's created, the road commission maintains it. Uh, the parallel provision is that if there's no road that's involved, then uh, it's the private property owner. The drain district builds the crossing and then the private property owner, the farmer, if you will, maintains it. But yeah, that is a provision of the drain code. And that's what was done here. Uh, we think around 1904, roughly, when these two drains were, uh, were created. So whose responsibility is it to maintain these? Well, it was the road commission's responsibility to maintain it pursuant to statute. The statute doesn't say what maintenance means. I mean, I think of maintenance as different than replacement. You know, I think if I maintain a car, you know, I can replace my brakes, I can replace the alternator. Those are acts of maintenance. But if I'm actually getting a new car, um, you know, that's not considered maintenance. So I, I think there is a distinction to be drawn there. I'm not sure uh, that, that it matters in this case because I mean, what the road commission did was exercise its discretion to close a road. Right, but the farmer is entitled under other laws to access to the tillable land. Well, I mean, first of all, when, when the road commission closes the road, it says we can no longer maintain and repair this road in a manner that is reasonably safe and convenient for travel. Therefore, under the law, it's deemed not open to public travel. So this segment of the road isn't open to public travel. The road commission has no maintenance responsibility as a result of that. The, the farmer here, Mr. Wash Van Washinova, does have access to his two parcels. If you, if you look at his, the entirety of his property, he's got two tax ID numbers. One is affected by the Lost Marine Grunman Drive uh, drain. The other is affected by um, Plum Creek. He can get onto both of those parcels through an open section, open segment of Nichols Road. What he's complaining about is that there's this small triangle, which I believe is entirely within what we've called parcel two, that is more difficult to access now because of the road closure. Uh, but there's nothing that prevents that individual from constructing his own means of crossing that creek. Right. I mean, what this suit is about is he's claiming that the road commission should be compelled to reopen the public road and to replace. No, I don't think that's what he's asking for. I don't think he's asking. It, it may, maybe, it, but my read is he's saying, I don't, you replace the, the culvert, the bridge, the whatever you call it, so I can farm. That's what I thought he was well, asking I mean, for. He, he doesn't care if the road is open back to the public. Well, um, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I, there isn't a mechanism for a road commission to replace a culvert on a road that has been uh, closed to public travel. I mean, the road commission spend money through Act 51, which is the Highway Transportation Fund. Um, that applies to roads that are certified to the state as being open to public travel. This segment where these two bridges are is not certified for Act 51 purposes, so the road commission literally gets no money. But uh, I think the bigger point is that the landowner always has the right to build his own means to cross that uh, those two drains or even just one drain outside of the public right of it. If he can get the permits. If he can get the permits, which I would imagine would come from the drain commissioner. But I, I, at least as far as I know on the record, there's no evidence that he's sought to do that. Uh, as far as the statute of limitations goes, I, you know, I think 
with a request for mandamus, there isn't a statute of limitations that we've been able to find that says, here's what it is when you're seeking a writ of mandamus. But mandamus typically mirrors some sort of underlying cause of action or breach of a duty that would have a statute of limitations associated with them. <clears throat> what they've chosen to argue here, as I see it, is the highway exception. Right. So road commissions have a statutory duty to maintain and repair highways that are open to public travel and that are under their jurisdiction. Um, that in the Governmental Tort Liability Act, if you have a claim related to the breach of that duty, you have to bring it within two years. That's 691-14-11-2. We would submit that, you know, mandamus, even if it were proper, which we're not saying it is, uh, would be subject to a two year limitation period. But Whatever limitation period you pick, whether it's one year, two years, 10 years, 15 years, uh, this suit was filed at least 16 years after the last culvert you know, crossing was closed. And so we don't believe that this suit would be timely under any statute of limitations that you would pick. Does it matter if the <clears throat> actual situation on the ground is that devices, whether they're a bridge, air quote, or a culvert, air quote, uh, are functional until they aren't. And then sometime in 2000, let's call it 2020 or 2022, the council says statute of limitations began to run in July 2022 <clears throat> when they said we're not going to repair what do you, what's your response to that argument? You... Well, I mean, the, the road commission's action signaling that it was no longer going to repair and maintain the road took place in 2004 and 2006. Well, the road commission said we're closing. I assume, I, anyway, that you didn't also have on it, we're not going to repair, maintain, and do all these 14 other things on your notice that you placed on it. Is that a fair assumption or is- Well, I mean, the, the, the notice itself, notice I don't here. believe the notice itself said we're not going to repair right. it, but that's, I mean, that is the effect of closing a road. When you close a road to, so that you're saying it's no longer open for public travel, what you are signaling to the public is that we are not out there on this segment of road discharging our duty under the statute to repair and maintain. And also the consequence of that is that liability for failing to maintain is suspended. So, and that action was taken in a public meeting of the Road Commission? In 2004 and 2006, right. What council is referring to, I think our interrogatory answers that, that we answered where we said, yeah, we had historically maintained this and we don't do it anymore, but you know, we're, we weren't claiming that we maintained it between 2004 and 2022. You know, we couldn't do it. We had stated to the world that this is not possible anymore, and that's why we have to close this road. Uh, and Monroe is going to continue its easement of this road across uh, appellant's land. Is that just, correct? Just because you close a road, meaning right. you know we can't repair and maintain it, doesn't mean that the right of way is abandoned. Yeah, I think we, we dealt with a case up north. I, sure. I, 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 well, we're, right. Lots I mean, of roads that have been closed. A lot of abandonment. Some road commissions would argue that the abandonment has to be statutory. There's something called common law abandonment, which if you can, if a plaintiff can prove the elements of that, um, then they can show that that was abandoned, even though there wasn't a formal proceeding. But nobody has taken the position here that any sort of abandonment has happened on this segment of the road in between the two culverts. Mm -hmm. And then my last point is, you're not saying or representing today that appellant can fix this bridge because this is your, this is your easement. You're saying he can choose to put a different crossing in. He can. You're, you're, but just to be clear, you're not suggesting he can continue this pre-existing abandoned bridge. He, he would have to, to get a permit to use or to continue and repair. I don't, well, I, I, well, I suppose it's closed. It, it would be up to you whether you allow him to use it. If it's a public right of way, which it is, uh, the road commission cannot prevent the public from using it. But what the road commission can do is say, there is a right of way here. However, we are not repairing it and maintaining it under the statute. And therefore, if you use it, it is entirely at your own risk. Understand. We don't think that you should, because you know we think that this bridge is not uh, safe to accommodate vehicular traffic. 
but there isn't anything that we can do maintenance wise to fix that. And unless they have the funds to actually replace it, which they don't and they haven't, uh, then this bridge needs to be closed. But if somebody's out there using it, they're not trespassing because it's a public right of way. Um, but they're also not able to sue the road commission under the highway exception if there is some defect that causes an injury. Um, That's plainly marked that, that, that it's closed. Uh, there's guardrail there. I'm sorry. Guardrail, I believe, it's has been awesome. placed across the, the right of way ahead of where the culverts are. Um, and, and I smile because I'm getting a visual of when I was young and upland game hunting in West Michigan or Northern Michigan coming across those in the woods. Whoa, what the heck is this? It's right. right. The, the access issue is something that I would just, just touch upon because you know the plaintiff has raised it and I sense from the court's questions that, that there is some concern about that. But again, he can access both of these individual tax IDs through a part of Nichols Road that is open. It's just that it's not convenient for him anymore to get to other areas within those parcels, this triangle parcel, because of the situation with the culvert. But the law is very clear that a road commission has to provide access to a parcel from a county highway, but not the most convenient access to all areas of the that. Total number of acres in all the parcels approximately. That, that I don't know. I, uh, I would have to speculate. I, I think it was one parcel at one time and it was divided. And I, I heard a reference in the circuit court that there's actually two school districts that are involved and maybe that's why it was divided where it was. I don't know, uh, somewhat, somewhat speculation. But uh, the point is in terms of the law of access, the road commission has given Mr. Van Washinola everything that he's entitled to. You got about a minute left. Okay. Uh, and you know, the, the convenience aspect is not something that any court has said gives rise to a claim. As to mandamus, I mean, literally, I don't think there's anything about highway maintenance and repair that is not discretionary. So I think to focus on the ministerial aspect of the mandamus test is, you know, the clearest way to resolve these issues. And I mean, we've cited the statutes that, that use the language of discretion. No case has compelled the road commission to perform a discretionary act like highway maintenance in a particular way. Uh, and so for all of these reasons, we ask you to affirm. Thank you. James McGovern, I represent the township. Um, I can be very brief. Um, you did not hear the word township once uh, during the appellant's argument. Um, it's not in his brief. Um, I believe that I can, I can assert that any claim against the township has essentially been, been waived. Um, any declaration that the township is statutorily required to fix roads, maintain roads, there is no such statute. Um, the plaintiff uh, appellant would have made that clear if that existed. Uh, you will not find one because there is not one. Um, I think that the crux of the appellant's argument for the statute of limitations really does tie into 224.18, which of course is a road commission statute about regarding the road commission's responsibility. For statute of limitations purposes, I don't even know what duty the township has that you can connect a statute of limitations. Um, when it comes to mandamus, I will reiterate, which we wrote in our brief, the township's expenditures are wholly discretionary, just like the drain commissioner and just like the road commission. There are limited funds and how the township chooses to spend its general funds is spread throughout numerous different uh, situations. Obviously, the drain commissioner expends its funds on drains and the road commission expenses funds on roads. The township has a general pot of money that goes to various locations. When they want to use that discretion to assist the road commission and vice versa on improving a road, there's such limited funds that the entire township has so many roads, it can only pick and choose so many. That is the definition of its discretion. Mandamus would be wholly unrelated to any ability for the circuit court to say the township has a one responsibility to the this road and two it must expend its funds on this road. So I think the the, the court uh, 
circuit court really kind of focused on the statute of limitations, which uh, has already been addressed, um, and really didn't address the madness issue when it comes to the township. The fact that Mr. Uh, Van Washinova, uh, representing his client, didn't even suggest or argue anything about the township's duty, responsibility, or use of discretion uh, means that that should be waived. I believe this is continues and should continue as a case with the plaintiff and the uh, road commission. So with that, if you have any questions, otherwise I can uh, sit down. Thank you. Philip Goldsmith appearing on behalf of the drain commissioner. First of all, from a human perspective, congratulations is on the birth of a grandchild. Thank you. I oh am gosh. in that season. I, I, you know, I know uh, Judge Ledica has had the blessing of grandchildren, but uh, Judge Cameron is he's younger, so he hasn't had it quite yet. But I'm in that season of oh life as gosh. well, and it is, uh, it's, it's pretty it cool. Is, it's, it is <laughs> so <laughs> not to be see cool. I mean, it's yeah. It's, you know, it's, yeah, well, that'll be the light of your life. They, yeah, my kids already are, and so is my wonderful wife, but my granddaughters are oh, yeah, we're special. Well, again, congratulations. Thanks. It's nice to see you. Um, I, I really don't have much to add. I would, I would state this, that the obligation of the drain commissioner was fulfilled way back in the early 1900s when, uh, <clears throat> when these drains were put in. The cost was assessed. Uh, among all the property owners that were within the drainage district. Uh, this is a very rural area. Uh, if you drove by and looked at it, uh, uh, two words might come to mind, cow path. It's a dirt road that starts at West Dunbar Road and then goes north to M50 South Custer. And uh, so it's a very rural area. So when those bridges were installed, uh, it was, it would, if we look at the drain code as it, as it exists today, um, that would have been in cooperation between the road commission and the drain commission. And, and those two entities would have put those bridges in at that time when the drains were created and the cost would have, would have been uh, spread or assessed over all the people within that drainage district. So after that occurrence, then it becomes the uh, property owners uh, uh, responsibility if he needs to put in any drains or bridges to access his property. Let me ask you a follow sure. up on that, Mr. Goldsmith. So, 1904, the drains get put in. If they, if the drains fail, they, they just aren't working anymore. Uh, in 1930, does it then go to the, the, the landowner he has to pay for the repairs? Are you talking about the drains? Yes. Okay. No. No. If the drains need cleaning, um, then then a uh, an assessment district is created uh, through through a petition process. And, and the X number of uh, landowners along, that are going to be affected by it you have to agree to it. Yes, they have to agree, and then the the cost is spread over all those within the drainage district. So if okay, you so what about the bridges? If the bridges are no longer in 1930, they're not working right. They you had bad white bridge, whatever. The bridges fall apart. Who, if anybody, has the responsibility to replace the bridges? Well, since it's on a public road right of way, uh, the first inquiry would go to the road commission, um, and then the road commission would would make a determination whether they had uh, funds available to do that. Um, with respect to the to the drain commission, um, the, uh, the the drains would be cleaned through that special assessment district situation. Uh, there's one event that could trigger uh, the drain commissioner's responsibility to put a new bridge in if it's more than cleaning, if it's widened, if it's widened significantly or substantially, and the a bridge that's there cannot has to be replaced because the drain commissioner made the determination that all that water that's flowing out to Lake Erie can't get through Plum Creek or uh, so we need to widen this. If that would have been done, then the drain commissioner would have had some responsibility to replace, to replace in connection with the road commission. The, the, the fact in this case is that 
because this is a rural area, the property owner is all into the, to the center line of the road, uh, subject to the road right of way. And so when those bridges That's were- anyway, right? Yeah, well, except the platted subdivision when, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. But it, within a county, yeah, that's almost in any road, you're right. Uh, so when, when you, so that when those bridges were put in for the benefit, that satisfied the obligation of the drain commissioner way back when. The drain commissioner then doesn't have an extra obligation in the future to put drains, let's say, on the farmer's property because that that statutory obligation was fulfilled. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you all, Council, on that side of the courtroom. Council? I don't have a lot more to add, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, I would just indicate- It is an interesting case. Yeah. I would just indicate uh, there's a difference between property ID for SID numbers and pieces of property that the as indicated in the statute. There's three pieces of property, but two parcels. Parcels, oh, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Do you, do you know how many acres all together? Approximately 200. Okay. So there's 640 in a square mile, so it's a little under a third of a square. Long and narrow. 650 yards long. Take. I'm not a mathematician and I don't have such people in my 880 is a half mile. I remember yeah. because I ran <laughs> super slow when I was in high school. So I don't think I could probably run at all now. Cameron could, but I can't. So all right. Judge Cameron and Paul no. and no. medical questions. No. Right. Judge Lenica. Hey, okay. I became a lawyer, so I didn't have to do math. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Council. You, the matter will be submitted. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Next case is case uh 14 docket. It is a matter of RD versus Martin Fick. Case six. I'm sorry. Three six two seven three nine. Pardon me. And this is our eleven o'clock docket. Uh, right on time at twelve thirty. So. <laughs> Pardon me. All right. Ready. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, James Willard on behalf of the appellant, uh, State Farm. Um, it's a no-fault case. Um, the uh, issue is the application of the fee schedule, which limits provider reimbursement, uh, and was added to the No-Fault Act by amendment effective June 11, 2019. And the question is, uh, do those fee schedules apply to someone like the plaintiff here who was injured under a policy that was issued or renewed after the effective date of the amendments? Um, any published cases on this? Uh, <laughs> <sorry to> <laughs> no, Your Honor, there is an unpublished case that, uh, with your permission, I could bring to your attention. The reason that uh, we didn't mention our briefs is because the decision only came out a little over a month ago, end of February. It's a uh, it's Matty M A T T I versus yeah, and there was a request for publication and that's correct. So you're familiar. It with was it. denied. Yes, and it now was. there's an app filed in the Michigan that's Supreme correct. Court. Oh, yes, so this issue. Yes. Okay. Um, so do you, I I can give you the other information of the case, but if you if you already have it, it sounds like a case, case number. Right? Okay, <laughs> perfect. That's um, always. Yeah, I, it's a straightforward issue. Um, the you know under under the Supreme Court's Andrew decision, um, the right to pip benefits vests at the time of injury. Right, and, so, I mean, I mean the, the court basically said it's a fact. How is it a factual question? I, the trial court said that. Is it because it's related to damages? I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm. I'm Candidly, I'm not sure why the trial court said it was a fact issue. I mean, as, as I'm sure you saw, the trial court also was openly looking for guidance from, from this court. Right. So well, I'm going to deny yeah. it without prejudice because right. I think you both had good arguments and I don't really know what to do here. So you, but, like, how many of these cases are there out there? Didn't that judge say he, that particular he judge? He had, had five, five, right? Right. As far as I'm aware, this Maddie decision is the first one that resulted in a decision from this court. I don't know if there were others that are, you know, that are pending. Um, right, so procedurally, I mean, how how is this being handled? Because really it's, 
they're seeking, right? They're saying, hey, you were unreasonable, you didn't pay. And your response back is, here's our new cap. And this is, we're letting you know that you can't get more than that. It, it feels like an evidentiary question as opposed to emotion. Not emotion. Yeah, and to analogize back in the olden days when we would get these motions at the trial court level, you would get, you know, competing affidavits or you'd get competing, uh, you know, things far would uh, subpoena and they would wash the subpoenas and then to, uh, you know, for the schedule, the reimbursement, you know, so you'd have this process. Now I just don't. I mean, it just, it, it, it seemed to me unusual because it is related to damages, right? I, I mean, I would think it like, is, but hey, I, here's, here's what we're seeking. That you that you pay. It is, but there's that legal question, right? Of, Correct. Right. I, I so mean, it's. That, I mean, and I think oh, that's no, the. Yeah. It's a motion for partial summary. Just yes, right. it is a oh, motion right. for partial. Right. Yeah. Right. Sorry, then I should have made that. You win. You're done. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's just the motion was just the fee schedule applies to these. This is as claims. much as you can get. Right. Is right. It? With respect to treatment that's right. rendered after July first, twenty twenty one, then the fee schedules apply, and the so whole then the goal was to lower costs, right? Right, that's right. Yeah, so it's this complex, uh, right, sort of mixture of reducing rates, uh, reducing uh, reimbursements, uh, and offering options for, for reduced coverage as well. Okay. Um, I I mean the 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 question that actually the in the in the Maddie uh, appeal it was the same the same argument was was made by the plaintiff as here, which is uh, that. You know, you've got this period between the effective date of the amendments, June 11, 2019, and then you've got this date, July 1, 2020, which some other provisions of the No Fault Act, of the amendments to the No Fault Act, specify that there's a July 1, 2020 date for certain things that have nothing to do with the fee schedule. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the argument was, well, then that it must also right. apply here. I, I mean, I think as the Maddie Court found it, the mm -hmm. panel found it's a straightforward application of you know when did the plaintiff's rights best what was the law in place at the time in this case you've also got as we said in our briefs you've got a policy that specifies that payment of benefits is subject to the no fault act as amended i mean that's the law that's in place at the time that the plaintiff's rights best it's the law that's in place at the time the contract is entered so it's incorporated into the contract uh, i just think there's there's no question we all apply. had to sign a new right right Right. Making an election and it's right. Right. I, I've kind of. Oh, I, 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 I see. council is no. My my carrier <laughs> called and they kept sending me. They kept calling and emailing you, Captain, because I have it through USA. Captain Redford, you must contact. That's like the same with me. I, I, have, <laughs> you know, so. I have the same through USA as well. Oh, did same. it? Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. like I. I've yeah. never been so hounded by USAA. Yeah. I know, usually they're really good about leaving you alone. They leave you alone. They send you a bill, you pay it. You're not good. State Farm? Oh, uh, <laughs> I guess that's the first nice, time I've gone nice on record. Yeah. First time I've gone on record <laughs> saying that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we won't let that order a transcript before Thank the you. council. So is, is, do we need to even do a retroactivity analysis here? No, I don't think so. Because, I mean, the, the law, there's no, it's not as if the, the law uh, is effective after of the, the plaintiff's rights to benefits best. I mean, the law is already, in fact, it's it's in effect before plaintiff's rights to benefits best. But this no isn't rejection. Andari, right? It's not because, right, in that case, as you know, I'm sure the, the plaintiffs have been injured and receiving benefits and the rights of vested long before uh, the case went into effect, yeah. So, so that was the issue there was they're already receiving benefits um, and you know they've already got a right to the benefits that they were getting, um, so. Or you'd want us to publish this? I would welcome it, but I don't expect it, certainly, given that the <laughs> Maddie, well, <laughs> I'll just say I, my expectations well, are tempered, given that, that the, as you said, the Maddie panel declined yeah, but you know, publish, so. I, Who knows if anybody there asked, right? It, it, clearly, the request came after. But right, I mean, I, I, I'm the one who submitted the request, so because I was counsel for State Firm in that okay, case. Okay, so oh, the okay. answer, yeah, I, I think your answer is, Yes. So, 
It, yeah, it would be. I understand that. I, depending on if I if we receive a favorable decision, then I would have to you know, say all that of us are you know, no, former no, trial no. lawyers or appellate lawyers. It's like, oh no, no, we really want you to publish after you gave us this. Yeah, fantastic we're very suspicious about those opinion. requests after the fact. I'm so sure. I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, that's a brilliant opinion. Please publish. <laughs> Um, I, if you if you well, have questions, so uh, other questions. Right, it's an no. issue of first impression, essentially, because we're not we're not bound by unpublished opinions. Mm. Correct. Well, right. we're not bound by a grant of interlocutory. Yeah, we're, or, yeah. we're not we're not even bound by our published opinions. Okay. Generally, if we disagree, if we disagree <laughs> with them, we can you know ask for a conflict panel. So uh, that it, doesn't. It, it, yeah, that's true. It doesn't always happen. So. I think that's right. I mean, of course, I find the, the Maddie opinion persuasive, but as you might, <laughs> might not be surprised to hear me say, but but yeah, I think I think essentially it is. You're not you're not bound by a decision that's that's you know that's decided. Uh, that's no, it decided can be considered for persuasive value. Right. Okay. Um, I'll would like. I didn't say this before. I'd like to reserve a few minutes for yeah, rebuttal, right. but we'll see if. Four minutes, right? yeah. <laughs> that's what I do. I think you have enough for about 42 seconds or about just for... <laughs> uh, uh, good, good afternoon, panel. Keith Bank on behalf of uh, the appellee in this matter. Um, I don't think it's as cut and dry as, as um, uh, the panel seems to think or defense counsel seems to think because the Andrew report didn't think it was cut and dry. Um, well, Andrew, but as we talked about, I mean, Andrew was... These beneficiaries who'd been receiving the benefit of oh, I understand. In, in decades. Oh, I understand. But specifically in the ruling, they held open this period from July um, uh, 2019 to, to, to 2020 and said at the latest. In, in at gave, the latest. So they, the 2020. Yeah. And they could have said July or uh, the 2019 date. They could have said the 2020 date. The court in a footnote said, at the latest, this is when these can apply. So that's why I'm here. Um, I think when you're addressing it, and, I'm, and thank you both for being here. We certainly value everybody's counsel, but we really we value the two of you quite a bit. Um, if you could talk about or address when the contract itself references the no fault law, what, what if anything does that do to you know, your your position? Well, I think that in gets, addition to anything else, right? well, I, I think that gets into the the Andrew type discussion of what controls. You know, what do do we go look at what the contract provides when you were injured, or do we look at the global incorporation of everything when you're injured? Um, the Andrew court seemed to put a lot of emphasis on what the contract provided, and that's how they made their determination in the case. Um, and they relied on this body of case law from um, the workers' comp realm. Where in that instance, as soon as the amendments are made, the changes happen. Um, those are retroactive. There is no vested interest in those workers' comps cases. And the distinction they drew was the contract. In here, there's a contract that says you get this. Um, in workers' comp, there is no contract. So that's the distinction I'm drawing. You have a contract at the time that said these, you get this type of benefit. It's uncapped because at the time he was injured, they couldn't impose these caps on, on treatment. So um, my argument is- Perpetuity, in perpetuity. If so he was injured- Everybody has to either get a new policy. Oh, like the, he'd be treated like the Andrew uh, plaintiffs would. Um, simply, he was injured before the fee schedules took effect, therefore they aren't applicable to him. Um, it's the same outcome, except you're extending the Andrew opinion from the July 2019 date to the 2020 date. That's all you're doing. You're just saying that these people are treated like the Andrew plaintiffs instead of un they're treated like um, people injured after the 2020. Date. So it, you're not you're not massively expanding anything that hasn't already been expanded to people who were injured before July 2019. Um, those people, Andrew gets them benefits. You're just extending the Andrew decision to another year. So there is no retroactivity analysis. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't think so, because it's, it's whether or not you apply the statute to the contract, what contractual benefits apply. Um, and when those rights were vested, 
Correct. Or what, what vested? You know, what, what exactly right. vested? I guess, right. I guess that's the, the precise question. When um, uh, plaintiffs was, was injured, or the plaintiffs were injured, um, what rights vested? Did the, right, did the rights, the benefits that they got at the time continue? Or does the statute modify and modify those benefits? I mean, that's, the, the, the Supreme Court thought that that was an interesting enough question to leave the answer open. Um, I'm, I'm arguing that here today because of that. But um, as the notice issue, and, I, I, and just to um, you know, clarify my disagreement from the peanut gallery when Brother Counsel was arguing, we were given notice of the coverage options, correct? Um, we were uh, given of just the limits. We could continue unlimited. We could kick down to a 250. We could kick down to a, a 250. We could kick down to a notice. We could, yeah, we could kick down to a 250 with exclusions. I'm unaware of any specific notice that said, um, after this date, your treatment is going to be. I, that's such an interesting. Thing. So, yeah. so there was so. Now so, we could both be witnesses in this case. So. <laughs> But yeah, I just wanted to clarify that there, there, there was that sentence. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm, I don't recall any email that came in or that any, said, any notices that specifically said um, are given to insured that said after this date. Um, your, uh, your coverage will be. Your coverage will be altered because fee schedules will be applied to your treaters. Or I think like the that. default position was your whatever policy you had in place. For example, if you had unlimited PIP and you never replied, but you paid your premium, you never replied to the email, you never made a phone call, or you never went through their portal and you and you paid your premium, you still had unlimited PIP because right. Right. whatever you your had unlimited PIP, but with the schedule. Yeah, I'm not disputing that, but but well, I, I maybe, maybe not. That's what we're arguing. Right. I guess right. probably not. Right, right, right. So so but, but the default was always whatever policy you had. And in, in this case, the contract said with whatever the governing law is, whatever and the significance of that, obviously you you both split them up. Yeah, yeah. And and so I mean it's you know, I, I blame the Andrew Court. They could have said they could have made an easy and I don't think it would have been dicta in the case had they said this is a date, a single year their date that we're starting from. But they gave us this um window that now you guys have to deal with. And I'm sure that they're that, that this is likely going to go up one way or another. But and, and also I already uh, kind of has. Yeah. And um the um <laughs> And also the Pena case I cite in my brief right. that talks about the, the BI limits yeah, that is so pending that is currently been up. So, you know, I would recommend, you know, this court maybe take this under advisement. Um, hold it in but, abeyance. Or in, in abeyance, at least, abeyance. abeyance at least till Pena, um, since we rely on that and get some guidance there. Um, and that's and that's why I know nothing has been decided as to Maddie and that's on, on application. But at least as Pena, it might be a good, good idea to maybe uh, to just settle on, on that issue and it pro provides some guidance here. Um, it might not, of course, but uh, that's, of course, your, your discretion of whether to hold this in advance. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other Thanks. questions, I guess? I don't. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Any rebuttal? Briefly? I know everybody says I'll be brief, but I'll try to. Um, First point about the Andrew Court holding this open in a footnote, I think it's precisely in a footnote and was dictated because they didn't need to decide that it wasn't in front of them. They didn't need to decide, you know, is there, uh, do the schedules apply to somebody injured after the effective date of the amendments, but before some other date like July 1, 2020. So that just wasn't in front of them. They didn't have to decide it. And I think the reason they mentioned it was simply to point out, okay, what's the universe of people- Not deciding this. Right. What's the universe of people who these might apply to? Well, obviously after, you know, when they're getting treated, the people who were, you know, after July 1, 20, 2021, um, it could apply to this other subset of people, but we don't need to decide that because our people are well before June 1, 2019. Um, I, I uh, sorry, the, the contract language in Andrew, um, I just wanted to point out contrasts uh, starkly with the contract language here, um, which again, the contract language here says, uh, subject to the no-fault amendment, including uh, no-fault act, including amendments. The one there didn't say that. It simply said no maximum dollar amount for reasonable and necessary medical expenses. And the Supreme Court cited that specific language to say, you know, in say, in finding that, okay, these, these plaintiffs had a vested right to unlimited benefits on, and, and not limited by the fee schedules. Um, uncapped, I think we made this distinction in our brief, but 
you know, the Supreme Court references uncapped benefits in Andrew, specifically talking about chapter 21, and it's talking about these overall coverage limits, you know, that, that apply per individual per occurrence, not the fee schedules. That's, that's not the same thing. There's a difference there. Um, so the idea that, well, the fee schedules couldn't apply because they weren't policy, you couldn't issue a policy before July 1, 2020 with uncapped benefits is conflating two different things, overall coverage limits and the fee schedule application. Um, the plaintiff here was not injured before the fee schedules took effect. Uh, fee schedules took effect on June 11, 2019. They start applying to treatment in July of 2021, but that doesn't mean that they didn't take effect yet. There's nothing that says that in the statute. I mean, the baseline of the public act is effective June 11, 2019. And then there are certain provisions that say, and here's except for where these we're parts. Cap it. Right. Here's where we're, hi, here's where we're gonna cap it in the future. And here are the dates that we're gonna cap it. And then I, you know, on the on this notice- The policy, oh, sorry. The policy incorporated the no fault. Right. I mean, the policy, that's clear from Andrew as well. The policy incorporated the No Fault Act as it was on that date, October, in this case, October 1st, 2019. Fee schedules were in there. Um, last uh, point is, as far as notice goes, um, yeah, I think, again, the Maddie Court was correct in, in holding that there's no obligation to inform and ensure of changes in the law. Um, and... In fact, they did get notice in this case in the sense that the policy specifically said your right to benefits is limited by the No Fault Act, including any amendments. Um, so that tells you right there that that statute, as it's amended, applies to potentially limit whatever your benefits are. Um, and the uh, as far as the the you know the what we were discussing with the you know, with, with insurers laying out the sort of different levels of coverage. Again, that's overall coverage, whether you want to continue with unlimited, whether you want 500,000, a cap of 500,000, 250,000, 50,000. Um, it, it's, there's no, there's nothing in the statute that says insurers have to offer those policies that says anything like, oh, and by the way, you have to specify that the fee schedules you know, do apply or don't apply in this case. Uh, I just don't think there's any, there's any obligation to, to inform insurers. And in any event, they were informed. Okay. Uh, what about Pena? So, yeah, I, I right. I request that we hold this in advance. I don't think there's any reason to. I mean, they argue that Pena actually favors them. So if, if I, I mean, if I were taking that position, I would say, go ahead and decide. Because if you agree with me that Pena favors me, you know, the worst case would be if the Supreme Court uh, reverses that, then they're in a position where the case they say favors them no longer favors them. So it, it wouldn't end up, I, I don't see a reason to, to, you know, to, to wait until that. And as we laid out in our brief, it's not a decision that actually favors the plaintiff here because it's one where the court looks specifically at that language in the statute and said, look, the statute differentiates policies that were delivered or issued for delivery before uh, July 1, 2020 and after, uh, sorry, before July 2 and after July 1, 2020. Um, so, you know, the law did not automatically change the coverage because the statute distinguished by the date of the uh, issuance of the policy. There's no such language in the, in the schedule. Opinion is not controlling. No, not at all. And in fact, it, it supports it supports State Farm's position because, uh, by contrast, because here in Section 3157, you don't have language that says this is limited to policies issued after July 1, 2020. And it would have been very easy to do that. And the legislature did it in all, you know, several other provisions, including 3009. Thank you, Mr. No, all right. Thank you. Set. This matter will be submitted. Thank you, gentlemen. Court calls case number 17 in Ray K8 Biggs Minor, 367-434. No one appearing. The matter will be submitted. Case calls. Case number 18, 367181, in rate DA Thurston Minor. No one being present, the matter will be submitted. The court is in recess. Thank you. Thank you.